All right. Hey, hey, how's it going, everybody? Uh, happy Sunday. Happy Mother's Day. In case there are any mothers out there, you know, wishing you all the best today. And for the rest of you, uh, if you are able, please do call your mother. She'll appreciate it. So, uh, yeah, I'm feeling kind of motivated today. Uh, you know, kind of stuck at home, of course, like everybody else. So I figured I wanted to give this another go today. Um, I've got a couple things I want to work on. So first, I found a bug last night in Corrad, of course, after the stream that I can't reproduce locally, but the CI builds are able to reproduce a race in my stuff. So that was pretty fun, and I figured out a solution for that. So we're going to talk about that first. And then afterward, my plan is to work on the WG Control Go, so my WireGuard control library for Go. I actually uh, built this a while back with the Linux interface and the user space interface at first. But what's cool is there's also an OpenBSD kernel module being worked on. I added initial support for that, I want to say about a year, year and a half ago, and that was a lot of fun. But a lot has changed since then, and that project is now uh, much further along, so I've been asked to update the library. So that should be pretty fun, basically generating the equivalence of C structures in Go using ioctals to pass data to the kernel. Um, and some of the fields some of the fields you pass to the kernel contain a pointer to other places in Go memory, so that's a really interesting, uh, unsafe bit of fun. So we're going to work on that kind of stuff today. Uh, so first we're going to get started with the, I think the Corrad metrics stuff. So essentially I found a data race, which is pretty annoying. So let me see if I can, is it possible to just get stash one file? Because I'm working on a change here and I want to tidy it up a little bit, but does this work? Metrics.go. Uh, nope. Darn. Well, we can do this. Metrics.go.back and shoot. <laughs> uh, Metrics.go.backup right and then check out the previous version so uh this was the metrics interface in master today and i was having a really hard time reproducing this race i don't know if it's because the test runs faster on my local machine or what but i was able to write a test which reproduces it consistently so if you're writing a type that is advertising itself as concurrency safe and go it's a good idea to write a test that verifies that so effectively what i'm doing here is I have this metrics new memory type. We're going to create a gauge on it. And then eight go routines simultaneously will spin up, wait for a go signal. And then once they're all spun up and waiting, uh, we will close the channel and tell them, hey, get going. So from there, we iterate a thousand times, each of them modifying the same gauge, and then each of them checking the output series and the samples map. So this samples map is where the race is occurring. So if I run go test, uh, shoot. I forget race or just panicked. Oh yeah, fatal error. Okay, cool. So the run the runtime uh, picked this up for me even without race. But as you'll see, we get a fatal error, concurrent read, map, and write. Fun, right? And if you run it with the race detector, you'll see a similar thing. So this is similar output to what I was seeing in my tests in the CI build, but I could not find locally. But now I understand where this is coming from. So I think I made a mistake. So effectively, what we've got here is this metrics memory type has this top level map of series and a mutex to guard that. So I think that is okay. The problem comes in, each of these series has a samples map as well. And what we're doing here is every time we register a series, let's close this. Every time we register a series, we create a new samples map. We pass back, uh, we add the series structure to this map and then we pass back kind of a reference to the map. Maps are I don't know what the name is in Go. You know, they're not reference types, right? But when you pass a map around, uh, callers can just iterate or can... Uh, it doesn't make a copy of the map. It makes a copy of the map header only, excuse me, right? Um, so when we pass this back, if multiple Go routines are accessing this at the same time, even though we're locking the top level mutex, and actually I'm not sure if that's even necessary anymore, uh, we're not locking this map. So there can be multiple concurrent reads and writes. So what we need to do is... So let's move the backup file. Metrics.go. Right, so effectively what I have done, I'm gonna tidy this up a bit more. I was just working on this last night, kind of in a hurry. Uh, so now we have an under, an unexported series structure that has name, help, and a sample map structure. And this map actually controls access to its internal map with a mutex. So pretty simple, right? But this is really all we needed was to give each of these internal maps its own guard as well. So we're going to take this type, um, I think, what didn't I like about this? Oh, I wanna, yeah, this felt weird. I wanted to make it so that the map has like a cloning operation. So we're gonna do that as well. Um, okay. Map of time 
label combinations to samples. So this is going to be our internal data structure that guards each of these time series. Uh, set stores k equals v in the map. Inc increments the value of k by one. And then we're going to have a copy operation as well, or clone, I guess. Would probably be a more copy clone. I guess I feel like I've seen people use both. Um, anyway, so method uh, sm is a sample map. And let's go with clone. So it's going to make a clone of the, well, it's not making a clone of the entire map. It's just outputting the series from the map. So maybe we can just say samples, right? Um, or unwrap or, you know, let's go, let's go with clone. It's fine. So we're essentially cloning out the, a copy of the map uh, with the current data as it stands when the function is run. So we'll take this code and put it inside the body here. And now what we're going to do is uh, uh, create an output map that contains all of the data from SMM. Okay. Uh, we know the capacity of this map. So we're going to allocate SM.M, the length. Um, so we know how many keys and values we're going to add. Uh, we lock the mutex for the entire duration of the function calls, sm, mu, lock, and defer, unlock. Um, I know for a long time there were folks who, you know, were concerned about defers being slow. Uh, I am not too worried about that. And also, actually, I think in Go 114, they got a lot faster, right? There were some improvements made in the compiler so that I believe up to some insane number of defers. Isn't it like 255 or something? I could be wrong. Um, they added some nice optimizations so that defers can essentially be free. For, for all intents and purposes, they are free. So even though it's kind of silly here to just, you know, lock, defer, unlock, do one operation, it's better code hygiene. So I'm going to do it that way. SMM, uh, we can get rid of the double K, double V because that uh, K, E, V. So uh, this returns a map of string of float 64. And then we return, oops, return samples as well. Cool. Okay, um, let's see here. So clone creates a copy of the underlying map in from a from the sample map. Cool. So now we have the sample map type. Um, we are creating it and initializing it here. So now instead of passing a map back, we're passing the sample map that has a mutex initialized as well. Uh, every time we do a map operation now, we call samples inc or samples set. It's worth noting that when we eventually add things like histograms and summaries to this package, we're going to have to get a little more, uh, things are gonna be interesting. So that's gonna take some research because I do not necessarily know well the internals of those structures and there's lots of things going on. So uh, now, let's see here. So, oops, shoot, go away. <laughs> there we go. Uh, sorry, Julius is sending me messages over on IRC. <laughs> I should add that to my checklist really quick. One sec, so I don't forget. Uh, let's see here. I've got a checklist of things I do before every stream, and I have previously been turning off the GNOME notifications. So that was a uh, that was something I forgot today. Disable GNOME uh, notifications. Sweet. Cool. Uh, anyway, let me silence my phone too. So where were we? Uh, we were making a copy of the map for the output series. So within each of these, we're going to want to V clone, V samples clone, right? Is that correct? Yeah, because it's a sample map. We want to clone out the samples from the map. Um, so for each time series, we are now locking the top level so we can get it all the series. This is going to grab the mutex of each and now, um, let's see here. A series is the a concurrency safe representation of a series for internal use. Where do I have the series type defined? I wanna move it near there. Okay, so down here perhaps. Um, okay. Uh, with that, I believe our test will pass now and we'll, we will resolve that data race, which is great. So this is one of those funny little things, you know, you don't really think about it. Um, and some some races can be hard to spot, especially if your tests aren't exercising the concurrency of a type. 
So lesson learned here. This is something I, you know, preach, but don't always practice. I have this interface type here, and it says an interface implementation must be saved for concurrent use, but I didn't actually verify that. So that's that's on me, right? <laughs> um, we could also potentially, I guess we could factor this out a bit more so that each of these types, well, the problem is here is that this, uh, this series constructor is only on the memory type. Um, let's add a let's add a to do. We can give it to this later. So to do, check concurrency safety of other metrics interface implementations. So of course this is you know the memory implementation is probably the one that's going to be the most tricky because we're doing the most of that work ourselves. Uh, we expect that the Prometheus types would be concurrency safe anyway. But uh, cool. So let's see here. Go test dash race. And the concurrency test now passes just fine. So I feel pretty confident this race is probably resolved. All right, star. Uh, internal metrics. Let's see here. So make uh, memory series concurrency safe. Yep. And then now the CI build will run. Uh, that's actually where I was experiencing most of the problems. So I, I want to go check that out and verify that it actually does. That would be a good idea. <laughs> yeah, you can see it's been uh, it's been red for a while. I wasn't paying attention, you know. Yeah, the thing is with Source Hut, I'm not sure if you can. I, I can't remember if you can make it send an email now. You probably can't. I haven't looked at it in a while actually. But so this is booting up a little Arch Linux VM. It's going to run the tests, and we're going to verify this all works just fine. And assuming it does, I think we're probably in a good place to tag a release of this. So I actually did a little bit of work off stream last night to finish out the HTTP stuff. I guess I can show you while we're waiting. So I did not want to necessarily take all the time building like these data structures like on stream, um, the JSON stuff, it's a little obnoxious, but basically we added a few more cases to this type switch so that we can unpack things like the DNS search list prefix information, recursive DNS servers, uh, and routes. And if we check the coverage on this, I feel pretty good about that. There is one case here. We have a default. I like doing default cases in type switches. Uh, write a tool that can generate the types automatically. Yeah, that would be great. Um, I haven't actually, I've written a couple of like basic Go linters before, like for internal logging packages and such, but it is certainly not my forte. But yeah, that would be very nice. There actually is a tool I would love to have that I don't know if it exists yet, but I've discussed it with a couple of the other folks doing weird systems -y stuff in Go uh, that we will discuss in a little bit when we get to the WireGuard stuff because it would be very useful. Uh, big fan of the default panic, by the way. Yeah, me too. I, I don't think that there's any way... Like, the fact that, you know, Core Red only supports these options is, I think, that we're pretty safe. But that being said, uh, why not default panic? Like, that means clearly there's something broken in the code and I want to find out as fast as possible. So... There are folks who say, you know, don't panic ever, never do it. Uh, I totally disagree. I think that if you're going to make a mistake, I would rather have it bite me in a loud and obnoxious way rather than be something very subtle, you know. So. Cool, moving on. Um, let's check those CI tests. Did I remove dash V? Unexpected value, want one, got zero. Ah, interesting. I wonder if that test was only working because of a race. Okay, let's check that out. Uh, panic is for bugs. There's a reason the function exists. Yes, I agree. Uh, not everyone agrees with me, but I agree. Go test. Dot. So this test might not be racy anymore. It just might be um, flappy. It might be non-deterministic. That's unfortunate. Okay. Um, let's see here. So test advertiser verify. Arrays. My my hope is to get to the wire guard stuff pretty quick. Yeah, go test dash count equals one hundred. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, I will sometimes do that, but the, the thing is, these tests take three seconds to run a piece. So let's try ten <laughs> to start right uh, with race as well, probably. So. Expected value. It was this, right? It was checking the value of the metric. Um, yeah, so I probably need to gate this on. Oh, you know what? I think I might know what this is already. One sec. On inconsistent. Yep. I think this is a Go routine scheduling thing, actually. So what's happening here is we are firing this on inconsistent array hook. And in this test, it's saying, okay, got a signal ready to go. 
and it's unblocking this comparison. So we check the metrics possibly before they are incremented. So I think that's the problem here. So what we want to do is we want to report this first and then invoke the caller hook. And I'm pretty sure that'll solve the problem. Report and increment metrics before the caller hook is invoked to ensure that the, um, let's see here, to ensure that the output is visible to callers if they request it, such as in the tests, right? So I think that I think that makes sense. Uh, or is it not consistent? Report this for the ROC. Let's see here. Uh, yep. Report this for the ROC. Yeah, that seems fine to me. So I suspect this is the problem. This, this is a pretty simple thing, right? But. The idea is like you don't necessarily know when a given go routine is going to run, so I think that was the I think that was the issue here. I'm actually surprised I didn't run into that before now, but uh, let's try this. You know, let's give it 30 seconds to see what happens. So that was the only failure, right? Yeah. Okay. I think the I think the FreeBSD stuff is wedged. To be honest, I'm not sure what I did. Um, I do not have I don't have a FreeBSD development. Oh, it passed. Wow. Or maybe it's still running. Um, I don't have a FreeBSD development VM set up at the moment with a Go tool chain, but that is something I want to do. Because I do want to verify this works on BSD. Um, I do have OpenBSD, but I want to make sure that I get... I guess I wonder... I feel like FreeBSD would probably be more popular for running this sort of stuff. But I don't know. I know OpenBSD is very popular for certain uh, networking applications as well. Anyway, did I push that? No, I didn't push it. I was running it locally, wasn't I? All right, test pass. Uh, cool. So, go... Internal, core red. Uh, let's see here. So we want to make sure we report the caller state, report the state uh, using our metrics and logs before the caller uh, regains control. So I would expect that to solve this problem for good. If it doesn't, uh, we've got something something trickier <laughs> going on here. Yeah, go routine. Uh, go routine scheduling is complicated. You really can't rely on anything. You know, this is why it's important to use things like uh, you know channels and signaling and weight groups and etc. Um, because you don't know if your go routine is going to be preempted, especially now with uh, go one fourteen, I believe. Uh, there is more asynchronous preemption in the runtime. So. Oh, that's right. So I think uh, Dominic told me this morning that there is a new master version of static check. So if I go get static check, that won't work, will it? Okay, I'll pull it from, I'll run it from master, actually. So source, on of co, go tools, master pull. So we are going to use the version of static check from master. That's a lot of fun, right? Uh, go install, static check dash version. No version, perfect, so that means master, right? Uh, to verify, cool, okay. Run this over the whole thing. I think the first time it's building its cache. Oh, shoot, the cylinder director didn't match anything. Oh, it's getting the stuff in the vendor. Interesting. Is that to be expected? I feel like it ignored vendor before. Or is that a, is that a bug on master? <laughs> Um, I am aware of the linter directives and sked group. Uh, I did those. I did those on purpose. Um, anyway, let's run over internal for now. I don't want to. I assume Dominic has better stuff to do with his Sunday <laughs> than. I don't believe we ignore vendor now. Okay. Hmm. I could. You know, I could have sworn it did before. To be honest, with uh, the previous version. Um, let's see. Okay. Let's let's see here. Let's let's verify really quick. So. Uh, group.go. Yeah, that is... So I think that was the thing I was telling you about the other day. Um, I'll, I'll show you. I think I have a linter directive. Should it be removed? Oh. So I have a directive in place for sched group because of this. So this is what I was talking to you about, I think, on IR or Slack. Um, I have these break statements in here because I like being able to see the test coverage and verify that I'm actually... These... Um, so that's why I'm doing that, but 
Maybe if I get rid of the... Actually, is this good enough? Can I see coverage just on the combat lines? No. Yeah, that's the problem. Like, that's why I have those ineffective breaks there, because I want to see that we're hitting these cases. Uh, why am I still venturing with Go modules? So, at least, I think when I started this project, the module proxy was not uh, ready for prime time quite yet, and also I think it might be useful at points to be able to run this with all the depths in place. Uh, that being said, I think now that the module proxy is more mature and such, there's probably less of an argument for doing so. So I could probably remove the vendor directory. Um, I just have not as of yet. Time for me to debug why it no longer flags, flags those breaks. Okay, have fun. <laughs> um, so let's see here. Uh, right, so this is my code. Get diff. Uh, this is the master of sked group, by the way. So GitHub MD layer sked group. Static check. Uh, no problems. So apparently it just doesn't like the vendor copy. Or maybe it's not ignoring. I, I don't know. Anyway, I, I probably could get rid of the vendor stuff. To be honest, I've, I've experienced like weird, you know, CI problems with stuff like this before. I probably should just get rid of it. So uh, should we do that? Is that a good idea? It probably is, right? So, okay. Let's see what happens. So, I think I, hang on a sec, uh, mod equals vendor. I think I might have that in a couple of, okay, the make file, mod vendor. Okay. So, I want to get rid of all of the mod vendor calls. Um, I'm looking at the wrong editor. Right. So, first of all, uh, dash mod vendor, get rid of it, go away, use the defaults. Uh, oops, mess that up. Okay. It's gone from there. Um, now we have the free BSD build as well, yes. Uh, dash mod vendor, gone. Gone and gone. You know, to be honest, I'm curious what else this is going to break. <laughs> But you're probably right. I, this is one of those things I've kind of been holding on to without a perhaps a strong reason to at this point. Um, the one thing I, the one annoying behavior I have noticed with the module proxy is that if I want to push a new version of a dependency and update it like pretty much immediately, I have to do go proxy equals direct. Uh, otherwise, it just it seems like it takes maybe five or ten minutes, which is often longer than I want to wait. So it is what it is. Mod vendor, mod equals vendor. Okay, make file. That's all that's left. And then I would expect that everything should build just fine. Command core rad uh, version. Do I have version? No, I have V. Okay, yeah. Uh, dirty beta. Yep, I've seen that too. Yeah, it's... I mean, I accept that, like, you know, this is just distributed systems, right? Like, it, it can't pick it up immediately, but it, it's just a slight nuisance is all, really. Uh, so let's go ahead and go mod tidy, maybe? Uh, so this just removed a whole bunch of files, which is cool. All right, so star GA vendor GA builds GCM. Uh, okay, star remove vendoring completely. Okay, and now let's bump the dependencies really quick. So get D, yeah, so I see I typically have go proxy equals direct in my in my shell even. Um, let's uh, let's clear off that output for you all. Uh, go proxy equals direct. So go get uh, my dependencies, update them, do it verbosely, all the test dependencies too, and then tidy everything. So, hey, good to see you, Super Q. Thanks for hanging out. Did I post this? I think I posted this in the Prometheus IRC, didn't I? Twitch.tv slash MD layer. Yep. Cool. Uh, yeah. Awesome. So, uh, looks like all my dependencies are actually already up to date, which is, uh, cool. So, sweet. I think we're probably in a good shape to take, to, uh, excuse me, tag a release for this. So, I think what I want to do first is test this on my router briefly just to verify everything is working. I suspect it will be, um, but we've changed an awful lot of code between this and the previous beta. So... I need to stop the systemd managed version of this and then cross compile. Do I actually have a current going here? I have 114.1. Hmm. I wonder if that's. 
I wonder if I could run an upgrade. But I think 114.1 is probably... It's just it's just for testing anyway. So let's see here. So source, github.com. Uh, I don't think I have anything. Yeah, that's okay. So git clone, github, md layer, core red. All right. Uh, should set up SSH agent. I think go list dash m dash u dash all or all. Okay. Um, go list dash m dash u all displays all available new versions. Oh, really? Okay. That's new. That's news to me. Uh, shoot. Gotta gotta use those SSH key passphrases. There we go. <laughs> core red command core red. Okay. Go build. See the ones in brackets. Uh, yes, actually. So why didn't it update my dependencies then? I would have expected the command I ran to do that, right? Is this that minimal version selection thing? Recently started switching all my Git clones to HTTPS. Yeah, I... I think I do SSH out of habit because I have all the authentication stuff set up really easily. Um, oh, credential helper equals store file. Get out. Oh, cool. Okay. So that would make HTTP easier. That's good to know. I think it might not do indirect depths by default. Oh, fun. Um, hmm. Is there a, is there a new go get flag I'm missing? Apparently we didn't use the flag vendor time though I find out what we do now. <laughs> yeah, thanks Dominic, I appreciate it. Um happy to keep finding bugs for you. I guess this is why you wanted me to run a master, right? So uh what's fail safe it's run go get explicitly on the individual modules you want to upgrade. Right. Yeah, totally. Um The thing is is I think that all the stuff I really care about, like XSYS, uh Netlink, Go CMP, those are all up to date. My NDP package, I believe. Um so I think a lot of these other ones are a sec. So let's just check the let's check the go mod or not care about indirect devs. Yeah, I think that the NDP stuff, the changes I made yesterday are in there. I think this is probably okay. Oh, okay, cool. I'll have to I'll have to look into that uh, HTTP auth for GitHub. Um, I guess the advantage of doing it that way is you would get like the CDN right versus just the uh, SSH uh, direct stuff. But I don't I I don't usually have a big problem with like SSH clones and everything. Um. Cool, so yeah. So we can run core red, development beta, yep. Uh where's the convention from for when you use LL for local logger and main? Yeah, that was a that was a convention we had for our structured logging library at DigitalOcean actually. So LL for local logger. Um it's just a little less verbose than log. It doesn't shadow the name of the log package. Um it's less it's shorter than logger. And then I started using MM as a kind of a mirror of LL. Like MM is the metrics node, but it just it's just a convention that has stuck with me and I kind of like it, you know. So that's really what it comes down to. So what I want to do really quick is I want to verify I wanna take the Alright, we're gonna We're gonna hide stuff just in case the system D file has some stuff in it I don't want to share. Um let's see here. So I'm basically gonna copy the command line from my Nix OS install and just use the configuration file uh that is actually on my router. That is serving my current LAN right now, and we're gonna swap out Core Red. So, okay, uh, stop. Uh, makes sense. Logger is what I'd use from could be used from could be Python leaking. Yeah, totally. I think everybody's got their own conventions, right? That's just that's just mine. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna um, say it's the the correct way. <laughs> you know, it's just what I do. Uh, yeah. So I have stopped Core Red on my router. We can actually verify that really quick. Uh, I'll remove that. We can verify that by trying to run a router solicitation and pretty quick here, my default route is going to fall off. So I should probably uh, fix that, right? <laughs> um, let's see here. So we'll, we'll do sudo for now. It's fine. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is Red beta serving my LAN. Uh, NDP RS. Okay. We're good. Looks good. Uh, let's see here. Uh, do you have any docs on what your router is for base OS hardware? Yes, actually. So one sec. APU 4D4. So this is what I use as my router is a PC Engine's APU 4D4 board. Uh, it is very cool. Has a little embedded AMD CPU, four gigs of RAM, four gigabit Ethernet ports, serial, uh, MSATA slot, mini PCIe SIM cards. Like this thing is awesome. It's super cheap. It's great. It's all open hardware, open firmware. Uh, I love it. 
And for my router OS, I am running Nix OS. So if you go to my home lab repo and check out the Nix OS folder, you can actually see all the configuration management for my router and my server, which is pretty cool. And there's a lot of shared stuff too. So I am not a Nix OS expert, but I love it. I think that definitely we're going to do a stream about Nix OS at some point because it's, it's awesome. Um, actually today, I think probably we're going to do is tag a new release of Corrad, put a PR out for it for Nix OS so I can get it running on my router in the next few days and then move on to the layer guard stuff. So Yeah, uh, check out check out my home lab folder. Check out my NixOS folder under home lab, and also check out the the APU. It's a super cool board. So we now have CoreRed serving uh, my LAN using the development version, which also means that we have things like the API, right? So I can do curl localhost ninety four thirty. Oh, not localhost. It's actually my router now. Uh, I'm gonna maximize this really quick. Uh, make that much smaller. Router. 9430, core red development beta. Yep, exactly what we'd expect. Uh, API interfaces, JQ dot. Awesome. So check that out. So we can actually see all of the configurations. So we actually added all of this stuff in the API. So for this interface, it's applying this configuration right now with DNS search list, with prefixes. Uh, very cool. Actually, I think that, you know, the one thing we forgot to add was the content type header. So uh, JSON UTF-8. Uh, one sec head dash n five sure uh, yeah so content type plane we should we should fix that i mean it's just a it's just a small correctness thing but we should fix that for sure uh yeah but i feel i feel pretty good about this i think it's gonna uh, let me restart the existing version of core red running on my router okay uh Oh, might want to fix the make file for adding it to a distro. Timestamp from seconds isn't great for reproducible builds. Want to read from source state, epoch, and then add that trim path. Interesting. Okay. Um, so the way I'm using this, the way I'm doing it right now is I run the make file and then I just copy uh, whatever value was spit out and then put that in like the NixOS build. Um, I admit it's probably not the, the cleanest way, but uh, if you have any, if you have any like links for that, I've never heard of source state, epoch, or epic. Um, I don't actually know how that's pronounced, but uh, if you have any links for that, I'd love to check it out. But in the meantime, just what I've been doing for the meantime is probably okay for NixOS. Uh, but that being said, I would love to get this package elsewhere too. And I'm happy to comply. It's just more so I wanted a, a date in mind so users have some idea of how old the code they're running is. So if I make this right now, you'll see I get a link timestamp of this. And I'll probably just copy and paste this into the NixOS build. Um, but we're going to fix the JSON thing first because I, I want to be a good, a good HTTP uh, citizen or netizen or whatever you call it, you know. Uh, by the way, uh, thank you all for hanging out today. I'm seeing, you know, lots of familiar faces from the past day or the past couple of days. That's really great. Uh, I encourage folks to, you know, chat and join. If there are people here watching without Twitch accounts, definitely I recommend making one, hanging out. Uh, the Twitch chat is a great time. There's a lot of really inform or informational stuff going on. Yeah, we have a lot of good discussions, so please do check it out. Oh, okay, reproducible builds. Okay, uh, cool. Thank you. I will, I will bookmark this and I will take a look. Thank you very much. Yeah, I want to do what I can to produce a make the builds as reproducible as possible. Um, but the thing is, is like this is still my personal project, so I just haven't put that much effort in outside of like Nix OS, which is where I'm using it. You know. Right, we wanted to add the header. Right, so anything that returns JSON needs to add the content type header. For now, there's just the one thing that returns JSON, so we can probably add the header here, but we can factor it out into a middleware at some point if we need to as well. So, uh, let's see here. To do factor out JSON serving middleware. So, W header set. Uh, something important to note, actually. So, the HTTP headers API here has the function add as well as set. Set is almost certainly what you want because add will actually, if there's an existing header, it will add another one or it will do it with like the, whatever the syntax is for multiple values in the same header in HTTP. Um, and you don't want that. I, I've run into a problem before where a, a key was being passed around, like an API key sort of thing was being passed around and we were using add. So potentially uh, folks were able to like spoof a value 
using that, which is very problematic. So you definitely want to use set. Uh, it could be that there's like, I know there's a couple of like Go security linters out there, right? Uh, perhaps they have a check like this, but set is almost certainly what you want. So something to keep in mind. Application JSON, care set equals UTF-8. Is it with the hyphen or not? I can never remember. Uh, content type application JSON. Let's see here. UTF-8. Care set equals UTF-8. Okay. Uh, yep, that looks like that's right. So now uh, we, we made a change. We should verify that in the headers. So anything that's calling interfaces should expect a... Anything that gets a successful response should expect a header. So we need to introspect the headers as well now. Right? Yeah, we should probably pass the headers map in. Uh, headers. Let's see here. So we want uh, response headers. Response header. Body. Okay. Uh, fixed on master. The linter directives are pointless though, and you want to fix your upstream repos, but we'll flag it no longer. We'll no longer flag it in your dependencies vendor. Okay, cool. Uh, I will pull a latest static check really quick. Source. Nice little quick change there, it looked like. Go install. Right. Um, we can log out of the router. Oh yeah, it doesn't compile right now. So okay, but thanks, static check. Uh, <laughs> I'll run it. I'll run it again in a sec. But thank you for the quick fix in that. You really didn't have to do that, but I appreciate it. Header, HTTP header. Nope. Header. So now a lot of these functions we don't care about the header. Uh, HTTP dot header. Oh, you know, I guess we could look at the. We could do something smart here. Look at the. What's GL short for? Uh, git, I think it's, hang on a sec, which GL? Uh, hello? Alias? GL. I think it's like git pull twice or something because the, I want to say the git, uh, the git extension or this, whatever I'm using for my shell here, I forget exactly what it is, would occasionally need to be pulled twice. So I'm pretty sure when I type GL, it's just git pull, git pull. Or like git pull origin something, alias GL. Yeah, git pull or git pull. <laughs> Right. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty silly, but uh, this is uh, this is how I wallpaper over my problems, right? <laughs> as uh, as mentioned on the stream yesterday, I don't think I have the best shell hygiene. If you're looking for that kind of stuff, you're probably and it's L because there's an L and pull. Yeah, exactly. Like I think the problem is GP is get push, so GL is get pull. Um, because I have GLG for get log. I don't remember where I came up with these conventions, to be honest. Um, I feel like I might have used some kind of Z shell plugin a long time ago, but now I use Bash again. So it's been, it's been years. It's just muscle memory, you know. Y you understand how that goes. Um, so actually, I think for the Prometheus endpoint, it would be nice to check. I'm pretty sure Prometheus outputs some kind of uh, headers, right? So I'm pretty sure it would be nice to check that. So let's go ahead and run this really quick. We're gonna cheat and use the, okay. Localhost 9430 metrics. Oh, right, yeah, so it can't actually fetch metrics because there's no, the interface doesn't exist. Uh, IP adder, no. We need to run the development script, which brings up a beat pair, right? Go build, sudo, run it. Sudo, do what I say. Pseudo or sudo? I've, I've always said sudo. I feel like sudo, you know, as in like P-S-E-U-D-O is easier to say. Uh, cool. Okay. Head dash and 10. Hmm. I was wondering if, if Prometheus had some kind of different uh, content. Well, let's check the, let's check the base. Version equals 0 0.0.4. Is that is that part of the Prometheus metadata? I guess it doesn't really matter. We don't have to care. I mean, we're already checking the body. Like, I guess that would be more so testing the Prometheus library than our own code. So we're gonna we're gonna leave that alone. That is not a big deal. Um, but for the index, we probably should verify text because it's going to be text all the time. It's not going to be JSON. So, right.
And now we can make a couple of constants because I hate duplicating strings. Uh, const content text equals content JSON equals If there are folks here from the, the WireGuard channels and such, uh, welcome. I definitely do tend to get to the WireGuard stuff, I promise. Really, for real. <laughs> um, we just happened to find a couple of uh, problems today that we had to fix. But that should be really fun, actually. I had a really good time uh, splunking into the OpenBSD, IOCTL uh, APIs and stuff. Like, it's definitely a whole different world than, like, Netlink. Um, but it's pretty fun. So we would expect h. Uh, diff, you want content text. You got... It's substitute user do, hence I pronounce it with a do. Oh, okay. You know, I actually thought it was super user do. But I guess substitute would be more broad and more general, right? So now we want right still have to fix the rest so I guess we could do a search and replace right body okay so now uh, underscore HTTP header body array byte and do it. What was that? Sounded like a neighbor dropped something. So uh, I probably just duplicated these, didn't I? Ah, shoot. Oh, I hate when you write an overly broad search and replace. It's not that big of a deal. It's just a nuisance, right? So for Metheus, we don't care. We just care about the content type here. And we care about the content type in the JSON endpoints as well. So uh, yeah, I suppose we can just check it in the first JSON body. Actually, I could have this helper verify it for me. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? And now that I said that, I just realized I've always been pronouncing it as pseudo. <laughs> exactly. I was right. <laughs> That's great. HB, HB. Well, I guess we're going to be doing an assertion now within here. We can go without for now. We can go without. We don't have to add that. Um, hmm. So we just want to check and verify that it's JSON probably on this endpoint because this is going to be the fully populated one. So we verify the body, we verify the headers. So h.get content type content JSON. I also do pseudo, but that might be because German pronunciation is like that. Uh, yeah, maybe. I have, uh, I have no idea. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. <laughs> So the thing is, is I have a, I have a horrendous, uh, horrendous U.S. Midwest accent. So the way I pronounce things is probably quite strange to you all. So <laughs> I apologize. Yeah, the first time I heard my voice on a, a recording of like a conference talk, I was so embarrassed. You know, it's just one of those things that everybody has to uh, kind of learn to accept <laughs> about themselves. <laughs> Or you just don't watch your own talks. Can't be as strange as a German accent. Yeah, maybe. I'm trying to think. I feel like I find German accents pretty intelligible, though. But it's because you are from Michigan. Yes, definitely very much so. Uh, but also, my nose is just, like, permanently congested. So I sound even more nasally than your typical Midwesterner, which is uh, a pain. Uh, cool. So now we're adding the right header. So the interfaces type is going to give us content type application JSON UCF8. That's great. <laughs> uh, and with that, I think we have 
fixed up a lot of the to-dos and stuff we had, so I think we're probably in good shape to... Oh, wow. Lots of to-dos here. I think we're probably in good shape to cut a new beta of this. I think that it's been it's been a while. I want to start running this at home, um, especially since I changed all of the the retry logic and the interface forwarding logic. Um, the metrics are all totally new. Yeah, we're probably at a good a good place to uh, start doing that. Let me did I add did I add new new metrics or not? I think I had the yeah, I have autonomous and I have on link. Okay, that that'll be good enough for now. Um, yeah, let's let's cut a beta. Let's do it. So, um, I know there's probably smarter ways to do this, but what I typically just do is just do a git tag really quick, and then I have to... Does it show for the first result now? Okay, third, I'll take it. But the other ones are my links too. Um, so now what I have to do is just do a git tag, and oops, the previous release was 023, so we're going to do 024. Cool. Uh, git... Oops. Nope, git tag... You know, it's so funny. I lived, I used Linux for five or six years before I discovered Control R. I used to use history. I used to grep history. I used to do stuff like that. And I cannot believe how long it took me to discover Control R. It was unbelievable. It's been a total game changer. Uh, 024. 024 beta. Have I been tagging these like that, or have I been specifying? It doesn't really matter. Yeah, okay. Is it fuzzy? Is it fuzzy searching? Is that just a bash thing? Yeah, it, it, I feel like it's in most shells, but yeah, it is kind of like fuzzy searching. It's like, you know, give me something that looks like this. So if I start typing in like, you know, some DD command I ran or some rsync command I ran, I can usually get it right back with the right flags and stuff. So that's very, very handy, as you can imagine. Uh, get push tags. And now we have a release, so now we can create a new NixOS uh, package and such. So the way I've been doing that before, I've been developing on my router, which is kind of slow, but I don't think I have the environment set up on my server yet, which is also NixOS, but... Do I have the SSH keys? Um, okay, let me... Let's find out really quick. One sec. I wonder if I can work on Nix package. Oh, I do have Nix packages on here. Okay. Um, if I can work on this on my router, it's going to be, or my, my server, it's going to be a lot faster because the CPU difference is uh, pretty astounding. So, okay. Um, oh, one sec. There we go. So we're logged into my router now. Uh, get to pull. Actually, let's do the SSH agent, right? So, uh, what is it? Um, eval. Nope. Uh, isn't it like eval SSH agent? Or no, it's just like this, right? There we go. Right. So SSH add uh, dot SSH MD layer. Yes. Supercharging control R with FZF is great. Control R by default is substring, but FZF gives you that sweet fuzzy searching. Yeah, I should. I've installed FZF a couple of times. I need to use it more. And yes, con using Control R on stream is quite risky. Yeah, that's the uh, that's definitely a concern. <laughs> I'm trying to be very careful. <laughs> and of course, I don't have my Git aliases on my server because I don't have good dot file hygiene. So uh, whatever. Okay. Um, what was that? Isn't there like Nix? prefetch URL, something like that. Yeah, that's that's what I want. Um, one moment. I need a new terminal. Off stream. Next prefetch. Prefetch URL dash dash unpack. Right. Okay, so this is what I want. So in order to get this working for Nix, I have to nano packages tools networking core rad. Oh, default. Right, so this is the Nix, Nix OS der or Nix derivation for Core Red. Uh, now that we just tagged v024, right? Didn't we just do that? Uh, we want to update this and submit a PR to the repositories so that myself and others can pull this from the unstable tree. 024. Uh, the SHA-256, I will have to compute um, using, let's see here... 
Uh, one more second. Okay, I guess this is fine. So nix prefetch URL uh, dash dash unpack. So I feel like this is not incredibly well documented. I'm not really sure why, but I need to fetch the URL of the archive that GitHub makes, which is something in the format of, hang on a sec, tar gz. Yes, this one, okay. This, so I need to fetch this URL and unpack it so I can get the SHA-256 hash so I can fill that out in this next derivation, which is a pain, so. Cool. So I take this and copy it, put this in the SHA-256, and then the modules, I have to, as far as I can tell, just build it. I don't think there's any other choice. Um, and then as, as for the link timestamp, again, this is not ideal, but we're just going to make it and we're gonna take whatever timestamp is right here. Yeah, good enough. So that way, this is something I want to automate as well if I can, but that's fine. So now that I have this, um, I save this. Yes, those are still correct. This is all still correct. I am the maintainer. We save that file. We CD into Nix packages and we will do a Nix build. All oh, right, I was building an ISO. Uh, Nix build dash a core red, I believe will do the trick. And we wait. But thankfully, this box is a Ryzen 7 2700 instead of my uh, APU4. <laughs> so it should be a lot faster than it has been in the past. Right. So as expected, it thinks the Go module's uh, hash is different than what it expected. So it wants this. So, oh no, sorry, it wants the got. So the hash that it computed is the one that I want to put in. As far as I know, there's no better way to do this other than just running the build once and letting it fail. Um, I could be totally wrong, but. Okay. So now we're gonna try a build one more time. This will actually pull the, rep pull the repository, calculate all of the hashes and make sure it's totally like reproducible and hermetic and it builds, okay. So then we do result bin core red. Uh, dash v and there we go we now have core red v024 beta uh, built on may 10th ready for nix os which is very cool so the next step here is to submit this to the nix packages repository so if i do a git diff um what did i change i just changed yes i changed the version the hashes the timestamp right so I can never remember the process to do this, but what I want to do now is go to Nix packages and look at my past PRs and then just fill out the checklist, excuse me, in more or less the same way I did before. Yep. So we're going to bump core red from 0 to 3 to 0, uh, 0, et cetera, et cetera. A little bit more. Um, okay. Oops, oops, oops. There we go. So we're gonna need another browser open. Also in guest mode, because I don't trust any of you. <laughs> Probably for good reason, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. So we take this, git diff, uh, git status, git add packages, git commit. Never trust the internet, yes, correct. Uh, although I've met some of you in person, I would say you're pretty trustworthy people. Uh, yeah, never trust the internet. <laughs> uh, the commit message is 023 to 034. Okay. 023, 024. Right? Yeah. Okay. So this is how I bump. Actually, I want to do this on a branch. So git checkout dash b mdl core red. And then I want to run that again. That's just the long con. Yeah. Uh, git push fork head, right? Git remote dash v. I don't think I can direct. Oh, okay. So git remote add fork GitHub MD layer nix packages. Yep. Okay. So now we can write down here. If I refresh this, there we go. Okay. So now what we're doing is we are submitting a pull request so that this will documentation has changed. Um, okay, sure. 
from two. Yep. We are not back parting. Okay, I think we're I think we're all set on this. Okay. So motivation. Uh, new beta release of Core Rad. So we tested this using sandboxing because we built it on NixOS. That's correct. Uh, it is tested via NixOS test, but we're not actually modifying those in this case, so we don't have to care. Uh, we did test the execution of the binary. It does fit the contributing file. Um, everything else is pretty much done. So what I usually do is built and tested on Nix OS. And then I will output some of the logs to the stream or to the uh, the pull request. Let's see here. So we'll copy and paste some of this. Omit some and then give them the output as well. How can you release this quickly? I spent two weeks worrying I missed some bug before making a release and then finding the bug right after I push. Uh, I also do that, but in this particular case, I've declared the entire V02 series to beta, and I suspect I have maybe 10 people using this, so I'm not too not too concerned, you know. <laughs> uh, let's see. We also we showed the result, right? There we go. Corrad dash result bin. Yeah, if you're if you're releasing like static check, it's definitely a lot more uh, interesting, I'm sure. Yep. Obtain from oh shoot. Hmm. So I was previously tagging this with the different timestamp using the one from the forgot i should probably do this the right way I should probably not cheat um zero two four uh there we go uh hello i thought i cloned this into oh i haven't cloned that on my server have i okay github md layer i think i cloned it on my router originally which is the problem so Zero two four. Okay, so this is the timestamp we actually want to specify. We want to use the timestamp that is of where the the Nix, uh, where the git tag was made. Um, that seems like a better idea. Again, I am not a professional. Uh, I don't know very much about software packaging. It's unfortunately not my forte. Um, but I do the best I can anyway. So, uh, git diff, git add packages right we are going to amend our commit we are going to force push uh get push dash dash set i'm pretty sure there's a faster way to do this set upstream origin mdl core red maybe if i did get push dash u uh no not origin we want the forked version um oh force Force push. I've been working on a new release for months now. Yep, understand that. I feel you. You know. Um, okay. So now that I force pushed here, things should. Let's see. What's the timestamp? Zero four seven. That that's that looks right, doesn't it? Dash U is the same as upstream. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that I. Uh, I have to do that so infrequently that I just don't really pay attention, but I think you are right about that. Um, yeah. And then I will tag a couple of folks who have been reviewing them previously. So John Ringer, D. Anderson, and how about Dominic, since he is a Nix OS person as well. <laughs> cool. And with that, uh, we should have now a pull request that we can actually use uh, whenever this actually gets merged. So what I do now is I take a look. There is the these eval tests. So if I do uh, gram C of Borg uh, test core red, this will actually run the NixOS tests, which are pretty cool. Um, I suppose I can show you all that really quick too. 
So, uh, let's see. If I want to open up the Nix OS tests, I probably want to do that in my local machine. Um, I can't run them locally, but my local machine is Ubuntu, and I've been meaning to. Let's open up my server. I'm not sure if I can. I don't remember exactly how to run them, but we can, we can at least check it out. So basically what this, <laughs> yay, GPU crash, fun. So basically what this test does is it actually sets up a couple of different NixOS machines. Uh, we create a router machine that has a configuration where we are IPv6, uh, excuse me, IPv6 forwarding. We assign an address. We create a core red configuration that says it's going to serve router advertisements off of that interface using any prefix with a slash 64. We create a client machine. We tell it that it can be configured via auto configuration and we use end disk six because we can go ahead and pull that. Uh, we can pull router advertisements that way. We start up, we wait for core ride to start, verify the client can reach the router. And then we verify that the client actually sends a router solicitation and gets an IP address assigned by core using a stateless address auto configuration. So Nix OS tests are extremely cool. Um, this was a lot of, this is really pretty simple to write, honestly. Um, it took a little bit of going back and forth to get it all totally right, but it's it's pretty awesome. So I'm happy with the way this came out. Uh, yeah, so really quick, I'm going to go get some more water and stuff, and I think we're going to move on to the wire guard stuff. So I'll be back shortly. Okay, and we are back in standing desk mode. And, you know, it's kind of funny because I put my headphones out of, out of habit, but I don't think I'm actually need them for anything. I mean, I haven't been using them before, so eh, why not? Uh, yeah, cool. So the game plan now is to look at the wire guard stuff I was going to be working on today. So let's close down all of this, exit the server. Um, let's see here. Tidy things up a bit. So what we're going to be working on now is a bit of stuff with wire guard control go. So this is a library I originally started for controlling the WireGuard interfaces on various systems. So to start with, we have the Linux interface, which is based on Netlink or more specifically generic Netlink. So that is something I've done a lot with. I also implemented the user or the user space interface, which is based on uh, Unix sockets communication. And then also, what are they called? I think named pipes on Windows. There's actually surprisingly little code required to make it work on Windows, which is pretty cool. And finally, there is the OpenBSD kernel interface. So this is something that's been being worked on for I think about a year now. Um, by a contributor who goes by the name Encon. So I am not sure if Encon is here today, but if you show up, please do say hi. Uh, so what we're going to be doing is taking a look at the current state of that and updating my code because I wrote the read-only code for the OpenBSD interfaces about a year ago, but now I actually have a development VM set up with the newer version, so we can probably make some headway on that. So let's see. Close down that. Now we want to go to WG control. Yep. Okay. It's been a little while since I've looked at this, so this this should be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, let's go. Let's go through the code a little bit first. So, kind of the the overall structure here is at the top level here we have this WireGuard client. The job of this client is to abstract away different client interface implementations. So. Whenever we create a new WireGuard client, we call this new client's function, which is specific for per platform. So for example, on Linux, it is going to probe for the availability of the kernel module. And if so, it will use that client. And otherwise we can use the user space module, which is not recommended, but works just fine. For systems like Windows, uh, so everything except for Linux and OpenBSD at this point, uh, we use the user space implementation. And finally for OpenBSD, uh, this is gonna need to be updated a bit, but I have a, an environment variable that gates the use of this because it was still pretty in flux and I suspect this will not work right now, so we're gonna have to update it. Um, but if you specify this environment variable, it will actually activate the OpenBSD client. So this internal folder over here, we have these different types. So the way I've chosen to abstract this is we have this client interface that every type implements and also a device can say if it's read only or not. Um, and then we have the different implementations. So for Linux, we are using generic Netlink. So uh, for those for those familiar with my work, you might be familiar with my Netlink and GE Netlink packages. Uh, those are the foundation of this Linux client. The basic idea is you open up a generic Netlink connection, you request to get the WireGuard control family, which will mean 
Uh, it will tell you whether or not the WireGuard kernel module is available on your system. And if it is, we gather a list of all of the WireGuard interfaces using route netlink, and then we're actually able to manipulate them uh, directly using this. So for example, we can query for the information about a given device by sending the netlink request and dump flags. We marshal a set of attributes that say, we're looking for a device with the name of these bytes. We execute using the specified generic netlink command, and then we can parse the device structure from, oh, right, yeah, this is, uh, there's some tricky stuff going on here. So the the WireGuard uh, netlink code actually in, in Go here, or the kernel module will attempt to uh, split up large messages across several netlink message boundaries. So you actually have to do some logic to merge them together, which is a little tricky. But the basic idea is we get a set of netlink attributes and we begin iterating them to decode them. So given different types, such as the interface index or name, or the private key, public key, etc. We decode all these into a top level structure and pass it back out. So that is kind of the, the overview of this one. For the user space, we have a similar kind of interface. So actually the you know, devices, device, we find a device, we find out where its socket lives. Um, so for example, on Unix systems, that will be probably a device file within Verun WireGuard. And on Windows, it's under this shared pipe namespace. So this is this is pretty wild here. There's a lot of very specific Windows syscall stuff that uh, uh, Jason from the WireGuard project helped out and did a lot of this uh, initial discovery work, which is very cool. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to understand this, but if you're interested, come check out the internal WG user stuff. Uh, so we find all the Unix sockets, and then once we actually gather one, or also in the case of Windows, a named pipe, we are able to send a response to it so we can dial out a connection to it. We tell it we want to get all of its configuration and then we can begin parsing that configuration, which is key value format. And we parse each of the fields such as public key, error number, etc., into the structure. And as a result, we end up with this big unified interface. So what we're going to talk about today more so is the OpenBSD implementation. So this is pretty cool. So basically it's been, it's been a long time since I've looked at this, but we open a generic socket, just an INET socket, and we perform IOCTLs on it. Uh, okay, so IOCTL, I-O-C-T-L, uh, people will probably say it different ways. I say IOCTL, um, but the basic idea is it's IO control. In Unix, everything is a file, right? So you have operations such as read and write, well, most everything, you know, we see how that's turned out, but you have operations such as read and write and close, but there are lots of operations that don't map cleanly to that paradigm. So a common way that lots of Unixes, including Linux, at least in older APIs, did this was by using an IOCTL, which basically you take a file descriptor to like a socket or something, you call this IOCTL system call and pass in that file descriptor, and then you pass in like basically a pointer to memory. And the kernel can go ahead and just read that memory, copy it in, manipulate it, pass it back, uh, really do whatever it wants. So it's kind of just the grab bag, uh, jack of all cards, um, jack of all trades, right? I know Plan 9 people who are still bitter about IOCTLs. Yeah, I, I'll i be honest. I uh, After using Netlink for a while, so on Linux, Netlink has mostly replaced this sort of thing. Uh, Netlink is a pretty a pretty sane mechanism. Um, I, I much prefer it over this approach myself, but this is uh, this is what we have for lots of Unixes. So this is, the, this is what's expected. So the way this worked is pretty interesting. Um, I suspect a lot of this code is no longer going to be valid. So I'm just gonna have to start over pretty much or see what's going on. But I had some code in here. So we have a script here that will give us some C Go definitions. So we say we want to create Go versions of these C structures, such as IF group rec, IFG rec, time spec, et cetera, et cetera, these wire guard constants, um, and then these wire guard structures. Unfortunately, I think the APIs have changed, so we might actually have to start over. But there is some pretty wild stuff going on. So for example, if you have a C structure that has a union, then the way to do that safely in Go is if something, if something, a field in a union expects a pointer, you need to make sure that it is a Go pointer type as well, or else it is possible that the garbage collector could potentially move the data. Um, so this is a, it's good since it's really tricky stuff, but the basic idea is here is I actually had to create my own copy of this IF group rec, this Go IF group rec, and make sure that I put the memory for these IFGR groups where it belongs within the union, and the rest was just padded out before and after. Um, so that was uh, that was pretty wild. 
but that was a trick I learned from Ian Lance Taylor. So we're getting some serious like dark arts kind of stuff right now. Um, <laughs> so this should be pretty fun. But once we generate these definitions, we have definitions here for both 32-bit uh, and 64-bit machines, such as the octal constants we need, these structures here. Uh, again, you will notice this group's method, this group's member, uh, instead of being a byte array of like, uh, let's see here, so this would be 8, 16, 20 bytes. So on 32-bit systems, it is 16 bytes, but on 64-bit, it's 20 bytes. So we have padding before and after where normally there would be a union definition. So a tool that I really want actually would be something that can take a union definition and break out each of the uh, discriminants, I believe they're called, or variants within the union and create a CGO struct definition. So instead of me having to do this manually, it would be super nice if I could have something that takes each member of a union and generates a new struct type for it with the appropriate padding elsewhere. That would be awesome. So that is a tool I would love to have. So I have this generator script that will fetch the, uh, I think given some definitions, it'll run a few few little tweaks here to add things like build tags and such. Um, it's been a long time since I've looked at this. Uh, change types that are nuisance, deal with and go, use byte for consistency. Yeah, go format. Wow, yeah, this is gonna be, this is gonna be a good time. <laughs> anyway, so the way this worked before is we figure out how many devices we have to allocate memory for. We allocate that amount of memory and then we take a pointer to the first element of that memory and pass it to the kernel. So the OpenBSD kernel, we take this structure, the structure contains a pointer, that we pass that whole structure to the kernel. It looks at that structure, looks at where the pointer is within that structure, dereferences that, populates that memory, and then it comes back and tells us like how much was populated. So this is a this is a pretty serious, like, you know, typical C stuff going on here, but you can do this in Go. It's just a, a very scary <laughs> sort of thing. So I'm curious how much of this has changed. Probably quite a bit, honestly. So the only code I implemented here was the read-only stuff. Um, yeah, but at one point I did have this working. So I guess let's uh, let's open up our, our VM and see what happens. So I have an, a WireGuard OpenBSD VM configured here. So this is running, uh, let's see here. OpenBSD 6.7, which I think is a preview right now. Uh, IF config WG0. We have a WireGuard device. So I have created an OpenBSD install and used a set of file sets from the author of the WireGuard OpenBSD kernel module. And I have uh, <laughs> rebooted into the BSD RAM disk, told it to update from his server, and then rebooted back into this. And suddenly I have a kernel that is capable of doing this. So this is a pretty kind of wild thing. Pretty cool, actually. But this is our development VM. Uh, I have a quick little Go toolchain set up as well. I think I tried to run WG control go. Um, so if I run this by itself, WG control, nothing happens. But if I pass in WG control, uh, what was it? OpenBSD kernel equals one. We now get file does not exist. So I'm guessing that the IACTL interface changed and something is totally wrong now. So what were we looking at right now? Uh, devices. Hmm. So I think probably the easiest way for me to do this is going to be to put the source on the VM itself, set up SSHFS so I can edit it locally in VS Code and then just do all the builds on the BSD machine. Right? I mean, I feel like that's probably going to be the easiest way. So let's, let's do something like that. Uh, let's see here. Where's my other terminal? Right. So we're in for a we're in for a real good time, gang. <laughs> uh, SSHFS. Let's see. What is the path of this repo? Root wg control go. Okay. And there we go. I believe we now have VS Code open. Uh, let's add a little bit of, so let's see where that call is coming from. Um, okay. Now this is the main, we wanna take a look at the OpenBSD kernel code and see, I mean, I assume a lot has changed and we're probably gonna to have to mostly start over, but 
In Emacs, I would set my compile command to SCP and SSH. I have a single key shortcut to save and recompile. That's nice. I should, uh, I'm, I'm, I suspect there's probably something I, better I could do, you know, but so this will work. So I'm guessing it's failing here, almost certainly. So if group rec percent B. Okay. Um, command WG control. So I can just do go run main.go actually. BSD kernel. Failed to get devices. File doesn't have really. Um, really? Is it? Oh, yeah, maybe the. Uh, has this changed? So it's been. I suspect a lot of this code is not going to work at all anymore. So we honestly might have to pretty much start over. Um, I guess we're going to see. We have some good patterns we can copy, though. So open BSD. Sweet. Yep. OK, so we're getting in there. Um, where is it returning? I suspect the socket call is not failing, right? So probably uh, main is calling devices first. Um, Use Emacs tramp mode, transparent remote to edit code in the VM, but in a local editor and compile runs remotely. Oh, that's nice. Is there no S trace in OpenBSD? Uh, there might be. I honestly have no idea. So, S trace, uh, package add, S trace. So, the thing is with me working on this on BSD is I don't, yep, I don't use any BSDs. So, I know the bare basics of like installing packages and stuff. So, this is going to be uh, pretty interesting. Okay, shell cross. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, let's let's do bash for sure. On FreeBSD, you'd have dtrace. Yeah, I don't know how to use dtrace though. <laughs> I know I'm a heathen, right? <laughs> okay. Well, now at least we've got a shell that is more sane. Um, so it's calling devices. Yeah. So why? Yep. Okay. Okay. Which one of these is returning not found? Maybe, oh, hang on a sec. Maybe some, maybe not as much of this has changed as I thought, right? So hang on a sec, name. Uh, so we're unpacking this structure from the bytes. We're trimming off the null or trailing nulls. My name. Maybe, maybe the general, actually, no. So you know, I think this, this IF group rec thing this is part of the OpenBSD kernel as is. So I think actually the trickiest part of the code might not have to change, which is going to be nice. Um, or at least what I thought was the trickiest part. Uh, we lost all of our history. Um, kernel, OpenBSD. No, OpenBSD kernel. Plus one, go run main.go. WG0. Hey, okay, sweet. So we are still getting the names of the WireGuard devices. So at least some of this code still works. So all of this, um, this is a, this is a really interesting thread, by the way, one sec, uh, copy. So this is the thread where I talked with Ian Lance Taylor and a few other folks about how in the world to make this work in some kind of safe way. Uh, I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun and learned a lot from this thread. So I will share it in the, Oh, looks like Twitch broke the link. That's sad. Um, Yes, yeah, so check that out. This this thread was really interesting, um, but I think this is basically where Ian got to the point where he said, uh, it would be okay to pass a pointer to a struct to ioctl if the struct contains a pointer to other Go memory, but the struct field must have pointer type, which is why I had this type, this Go group IF rec, because we are taking the union, breaking it out, and just padding it out or putting it so that this IFG rec uh, exists in the right spot in memory. Sorry about the question. Why is defs.go needed? It has ignore build tag and the structures defined in defs openbsd also. So the defs openbsd stuff is generated by defs.go. So this this is the input and then these are generated by, uh, is there a go generate command for this? I think defs.go defs. How did I generate these? cgo dash go defs defs.go. Oh, I had a script generate.sh, right. So if I, yep, 
So basically, I, read, I wrote this little script that will take the defs code as input. It will run go tool cgo on both 64 and 32 bit platforms and output the definitions. The build ignore tag is convention for generator tools. Yes, exactly. Cool. Yeah, I'm curious if any of the, uh, I shared this in like the WireGuard channel earlier and such. Uh, I'm curious if anybody is uh, hanging out, but uh, yeah. So it's good to know that at least some of this code still works. So the, the tricky bits with the, the union um, still work. So we are fetching the devices by name and I suspect just the, the IOCTL now is just totally wrong. The rest of the IOCTLs are probably totally different or wrong. So we're going to need to pull the Hello, uh, we're gonna need to pull the new kernel header and generate probably new definitions, I think. So chances are pretty good that everything up until this point works fine. Or actually rather everything uh, everything in the devices function works fine, but the individual device, everything from here on will probably have to change, is my guess. Yeah, this is a, this is gonna be a challenging thing to work on on stream. I. Uh, it's not that I don't have confidence. It's more so just that it is a hard problem with a weird environment, <laughs> you know, but that's cool. I think it's, it's awesome that we're going to get a chance to uh, show you all some very strange, unsafe uh, Go code, you know. So I think we're at the point where we need to pull the pull the header definitions and see what's what's different. So let me see. Can I get a plain text? There we go. Um, so first of all, do we have curl or wget? We do have curl. Okay. Let's see. Internal wg open BSD internal, the wire guard headers. Um, so now we want to curl this URL dash O I F W G dot H. Right. So cat I F W G dot H. So now we have the C headers. Uh, I, AIPIO. So I'm immediately, oh gosh, more unions. <laughs> We're going to, oh no. We're going to have to, uh, every time I see union, I know we're in for a bad time. <laughs> this is this is what I get. This is, I, uh, I deserve this, don't I? Um, data IO, interface IO. Yeah, this is totally different. So last time there was like git serve, git peer. Um, there's more iOctal definitions say iOctal set wire guard, get wire guard. Okay. It takes WG data IO interface IO. Well, the good news is I think we can probably start. Yeah. Allowed IPs. So allowed IPs, AIP, um, allowed IPs is going to be trickier. Peers are going to be trickier as well with this union peer endpoint, but it looks like the devices themselves should be pretty much straightforward. So we have a uint eight. We got a pointer. We have import T. Is that just a UN16? Maybe it's the BSD definition. An integer, which I assume is going to be native to your platform. And then a an array that contains the public key and private key of the interface. So I think we should be able to... Oh, flags, okay. I think we should be able to at least get this interface IO working. Um, it might take me more time to get a hold of the other stuff. What WG data IO? Oh. WireGuard device name, WireGuard device size, WireGuard device memory. So avoid pointer is a pointer to any of those other structures. Okay, so this is like the header. So we need to get that generated. We need the the get ioctal generated for sure. Um, yeah, so we're we're scrapping we're scrapping the w the WireGuard types and constants. This WireGuard server size of WGIP union WGIP. Yeah, we're scrapping I think all of this unfortunately. So that's a, that's a shame. But all in the name of progress. So configure right. Yeah, this is gonna be this is gonna be a lot of fun. 
missed a notification. Uh, that's okay. I think we're we're just now starting to get into the really uh, the really interesting stuff. So for the first half of the stream, we worked on uh, we worked on finishing up a couple things in Corrad and taking a new release. Uh, and now we are getting into the weeds with the WireGuard OpenBSD stuff. We pretty much just started. I basically just pulled the source code, and set up the VM. Um, yeah. Wow. This is gonna be this is gonna be fun. I'm definitely intimidated, <laughs> but all in the name of progress. So I'm pretty sure the tests are totally not going to work anymore, at least not in a. Uh, let's start ripping stuff out, right? I mean, none of this code is valid, so. So we're going to return a WG types device with just the name 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 type uh wg internal where is the oh, wg types so i have a types package for this yeah, types uh kernel open bsd kernel yep okay so uh this all goes away i think We're probably going to need some of this, but we can get it back from the Git history. It's okay. So if group rec, yes, we need that. Okay. Um, simplified. The types are gone. We still need the go if group rec. Ifwg.h. No, no longer. Actually, is that built into the kernel? So hang on a sec. So user, what is user include net ifwg? Oh, it is. Sweet. Okay. Cool. So we don't actually need to fetch the file at all. We can use the uh, we can use it off the kernel directly. That's good to know. Okay. Well, I'll be done a bit of surgery. Nope. Um, okay. There we go. So you'll see now. We actually fetch the very basics so we are fetching a wg uh, excuse me wg0 device so if config wg0 so you can see that it does exist it's openbsd kernel because we said it's that type uh the public key private key etc are all not implemented because we're gonna have to fetch other data for those um so this is kind of the baseline so perhaps we should do a git commit really quick just to uh tidy things up Shoot. Uh, mount SSH. Sweet. Okay. Oh, I guess I should run the code generator again, shouldn't I? Uh, verify that it works. Uh, where does it live? Internal OpenBSD internal headers. Uh, go generate? No, generate shell, shell, shell script. Okay. And that should have wiped out some definitions we're not using. Yes, so no more wire guard types, but the generator script still works. Sweet. Okay, so we are basically clean slate for the stuff that we need. So git add internal git status commit dash m internal wg openbsd uh, remove old API remove code for old API back to uh yeah oh identity personal again and push i mean realistically anybody who's using this package is not going to be using a year old version of the the thing anyway so oh hey how's it going good to see you here anybody who's using this package is not going to be using a year old version of the thing anyway so yeah we are, we just tore out that old code. Uh, hey, it's going pretty well. Um, we are currently working on re-implementing the WireGuard OpenBSD kernel interface for WG Control Go. Uh, so this is going to be quite an experience. So I wrote this about a year ago using the old uh, C headers at the time. Um, 
but it turns out that the API has been pretty much completely reworked. So we are at the point now where if I run this on an open VSD machine, which I have a VM here. Um, by the way, if anybody has questions for about stuff, like we're going to be going into some pretty wild topics today. So if you have questions and everything, you know, please don't feel, uh, please feel free to ask. You know, I'm happy to share. Uh, basically, so we are at the point now where we now are able to fetch the names of WireGuard kernel devices on OpenBSD using the WireGuard group, uh, the interface group, and that's it. So we are just at the very beginning of doing this. So it's going to be an interesting day. So the, the way this works is the OpenBSD has this concept, I think, of interface groups. And WireGuard devices are identified by this identifier. So WG all padded out to 16 bytes. So what we're doing is we are doing an IOCTL, and what I did here is I created a couple of swappable like functions. Um, oh, you know what? I probably should have tried to run the tests, shouldn't I? I I'm guessing the tests uh, just exploded. <laughs> Oops. I'll fix them in a sec. Um, so we have these swappable IOCTL functions. So what we can do is in tests, we can manipulate this pointer directly instead of doing crazy IOCTL manipulation. Um, but in the real code, we are calling this IOCTL function with the appropriate uh, file descriptor and call and passing an unsafe pointer to this structure because that way the kernel can retrieve it and do whatever it wants. So this is where the real dark arts stuff happens. But then in the tests, we're able to swap it out. So yeah, I broke a bunch of stuff. Okay, let's fix that. Um, let's fix the test first. WireGuard seems to be the new hotness, but never mess with it. Yeah, it's great. Um, it's, it's really awesome. I run it on my... Laptop, I've got it on my phone a little bit. I've got it on my router. Um, there is the the Tailscale folks are doing some really cool stuff with WireGuard as far as like uh, authentication and making it very, very easy. So check that out too. Um, I think it's an amazing project and I'm really, really happy and super, I'm super happy to share. It's been added to the Linux kernel, I think for the 5.6 release as well. So that's going to be, that's awesome. Um, very, very exciting time to be a WireGuard user. What was I? Oh, right. The tests. Let me do OpenBSD. This is going to be totally busted, I'm sure. Yep, okay. So, client devices. Yeah, this is going to be gone and gone. Oh, I think some of these are... Yeah, so the thing is here, I think the definitions aren't going to work because my machine is Linux, so it's going to complain about some of this stuff, but it'll still work fine. So, 104. So... Um, yeah, this all this all goes away. This is a shame. There was some pretty pretty funny code here. So for example, uh, when you do an unsafe pointer on the left hand side of an expression, you can actually assign it to like different type. So I'm saying like, hey, treat this memory as if it were one of these things, and then just assign it with that structure. So that's that's fun. There's a lot of really really fun code in here. Um, like, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this is like the kind of thing you should be like thrilled about doing, but I I kind of enjoy it. <laughs> I have a really good time. <laughs> uh, let's see. Wipe, wipe, wipe. Uh, no, need that back. Okay. 104. Oh, this needs to go away. Sad. I mean, we're going to bring it back in some form, right? Like, we're going to... I'm sure we're going to have similar tactics to deal with these kinds of things, but... It took me a long time to get this right, so I'm kind of sad, you know. But that's uh, that's software, so. Excuse me. 44, 45. So we do still need dev name, don't we? So I removed some code I shouldn't have. Okay, we're gonna go check out GitHub and get that back. Um, I'm sure there's all kinds of fancy Git commands I could be using for this sort of thing, but I, uh, I'm i not a fancy Git user. <laughs> device name. Funk device name. Okay, there we go. Bring it back, bring it back. Yep. Okay. Um, right, so... The tests are compiling, which is great. Uh, so now we are going to have to fix them. So it's looking for a whole bunch of fields that are no longer present, which is sad. I think probably what we'll do is we'll shoot for roughly the same structure. So we're going to comment out all of this. 
to do enable when ready. Okay. Um, all these are unused. Okay, uh, peers instead of being empty is now nil in 178. Um, yeah, you know, I guess we could we could initialize a slice of peers. Um, we're gonna we're gonna do that anyway, so we could just do that to keep the test the same for now. Peers is a slice of WG types peer. Okay. Um, it's just the client test device basic line one thirty eight. Oh, same deal. Okay. Device not exist. Um, yeah, I don't think this test will work anymore because we're not even, we don't have those functions anymore. So we're going to have to bring this back in some form, but I'm pretty sure the same system calls still apply. So to do um, roll line ready. Hey, your test pass. Okay, cool. Compilation and shorten fix compilation and tests for now. Okay, so the tests we have today pass. That's cool. Um, so now I think what we could do is begin taking a look at this. So actually, I was also linked to some code by Jason from WireGuard. He showed me the he gave me a link to the uh, WireGuard tools implementation, so I could check out and see what they're doing in C and potentially port that to Go. Um, so that could be that could be worthwhile. So I think it's probably worth taking a look. So uh, we need to let's see here. Source git zx2. Yep. Clone GitHub. Uh, no, actually we need to. I need to find the WireGuard tools repo. I need to go ahead and clone that because we want to take a look at the IPC code and see what exactly is going on. Right. So. Code for WireGuard tools. See, it's really interesting. So this is a you know this API would probably be pretty easy and elegant to express in C, but Go makes it much harder. So this is why you have to do all the unsafe pointer and such. Um, ooh, that would be very interesting. Yeah, totally. So IPC, I'm pretty sure there's an OpenBSD. Uh, no thanks. Yep, kernel get WireGuard interfaces. Okay, here we go. So we can see basically we're doing similar things, right? So we are, can you all see that? Yeah. Um, it's unfortunate that the C code is like hiding or it's hiding this definition because it's not on my platform. I'm, I think I'm using the C extension. I wonder if I can turn that off really quick. Uh, let's see here. Settings. Um, it's like a conditional compilation something so it's worth noting here uh, dim inactive okay there we go we don't want that so it's worth noting here uh, I am not I have done C I would not consider myself to be a competent C programmer by any means uh, especially when it comes to like kernel stuff um, this is just not my area of expertise so I would appreciate definitely if there's something really tricky, I'd appreciate some help, but it's, it's kind of cool here. So you can see we're doing pretty similar things, right? So uh, we create an IF group rec and the name is WG. Um, I believe in probably in C, this is something trickier. Like, you know, a C string is null terminated, right? So we have to do that with a byte array and go. Um, so we are doing the IOCTL, the IF group rec, which is being done with the 
uh, Siak, C, Gif, G, Mem, B. I hate these names. They're always terrible, you know? And passing in a pointer to the... Uh, a pointer to the IF group rec. We are allocating enough memory. So we allocate enough memory for these IFG recs uh, using the length of the... However long the IACTL told us we would need. Um, and then the size of each structure. And then we turn this... Or we take a pointer to the initial first element of the array. So this is a go slice and go slices have a backing array. So we are taking a pointer to the first element of the array and then we are passing that to the kernel and then the kernel is able to populate that. So I have group rec, I have group rec. Yeah, so the first time around the kernel is telling us uh, we we don't have enough. Um, I think the kernel, the kernel will tell us that like we have only passed in a certain amount of memory and we need to pass in an allocated array with this length in order to populate it. So the first time we're requesting to see how many devices we have to allocate memory for, we allocate the memory in Go land. And in order to use that memory in a safe way, we have to pass a Go pointer, which is why we have our own version of the IF group rec structure. Then we actually fetch the device names from the kernel. And because this IFG, right? Uh, hang on a sec, IFG is no longer referenced uh, beyond this point, it would be possible for the, I think the Go, is the garbage collector say, hey, this is no longer visible and just collect the memory. So this is why we have to have this runtime keep alive that says, hey, no, really, we need to keep this value alive because we're passing it to the kernel and the kernel's doing whatever it wants with it, right? Uh, so unpacking that, we now have a slice of these uh, IF, IFGRs. Let's see here. So IFGRs, yes, these IFG rec. So we have... Let's see. Let's open up the AMD 64 definitions. I'm just going to assume 64 bit, although we're trying to work on 32 as well. So IFG rec uh, contains this IFG RQU. I don't know where these names come from, but it's pretty terrible, right? But this is basically an interface name. So each of these 16 byte structures, we interpret it as a slice. We slice off or we cut out all the null bytes at the end. We trim them on the right, turn this into a string. And now we have a Go string. And then we can fetch a device, which in our case is going to give us the name of a device, OpenBSD kernel, and a slice of empty peers. So, all right. Uh, yeah, let's let's get into it. Um, this is going to be this is going to be a lot of fun. So basically, it looks like this is a lot of parsing code. We need to. So first, we have to have this WG data IO. Um, we're going to need interface IO as well because we're fetching an individual device. So. Device to size equals zero. This is probably the same pattern, I would imagine, where we are doing an IOCTL, figuring out the size, and then allocating enough memory. So, yikes, right? This is a, uh, this is some pretty serious, uh, heavy, dark arts, unsafe, crazy YOLO uh, system call fun, right? So we need to get the definitions for a few of these types. Um, we need types and constants. We need, let's see here. So we need type uh, WG data IO, first of all, um, is a C struct WG data IO. We need an interface IO as well. I guess we can just start with the data IO and the interface IO. We're going to need peers and allowed IPs as well. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure how far we're going to get today, especially. Um, so we're kind of up on like two hours streaming. I've got nothing going on today, so I'm happy to do like a longer stream again, possibly like, you know, four-ish hours. Uh, I guess we'll see what happens, you know. Um, but hopefully we can at least implement the basics of this so you all can understand like kind of what it takes to make this kind of thing work. Uh, by the way, so a quick little uh, self-promotion. I am at 98 Twitch followers. So if you are watching right now and you're not Twitch following me, uh, you know, I'd really like to break 100, so that'd be great. <laughs> oh, hey, I just got a follower. I guess it worked. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, two. Okay, we had 100. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's pretty funny to see stuff like that work in real time. Yeah, it's pretty cool, actually. So I was looking at the uh, the Twitch like requirements for the uh, affiliate program, which basically means like if I wanted to, I can make a small amount of money off of Twitch. Uh, I'm not doing this for money. I'm doing this purely for fun. But apparently I am already eligible, except for the fact that I just need to stream for like three more different days. So after today, this is my fifth stream. So I think I need two more. Um, 
and yeah, it's, it's pretty cool, right? So, uh, yeah, it should be fun. We could get a couple of custom emotes. Uh, do you track followers in Prometheus? No, but I should. I was actually talking with uh, I was talking with Christine on Slack, and she was mentioning uh, that we should get a Twitch exporter going. That'd be pretty cool for sure. I do have the OBS exporter. I want a Twitch exporter. I don't have one installed yet, but I totally will. That'd, that'd be a good idea, especially before my stream gets uh, you know, bigger and stuff. But <laughs> have the socket. Okay, so we need S I O C. So let's see here. Sounds like a topic for another stream. Yeah, totally. You know, I mean, we could set up exporters for the stream while we're on the stream. Sayak C G W G equals C dot C G W G. I should probably copy this. There's no way to get this right. Yeah. I wonder where this naming convention comes from, right? Prometheus. Yeah, Prometheus is awesome. I mean, I'm a Prometheus team member too. I'm a little biased, right? but I use it for everything. Um, I currently have an OBS exporter plugged into my uh, OBS, so we actually have graphs coming from the streams. So I do want to make a public dashboard. That'd be pretty funny if you all could see my actual OBS like encoder stats while the stream is going on. Um, that would be pretty funny. So we'll, we'll, we'll do that at some point. Um, let's see here. Reallocate. Okay, so I think... Having just these couple of structures should get us at least to the start, right? Oh, shoot. Uh, oh, I saved the code and it formatted everything. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, VS Code. Okay. Well, we're not going to need the file explorer over here, are we? Uh, we're just going to be looking at ipc.c the entire time. So, sidebar, status, sidebar. There we go. Sweet. Uh, yeah. Do we just need these two to start, or these three? So we have the kind of the header type, which is the um, the WG data I/O, and then we have the interface I/O, which is one of the possible pointers we can pass into it. Oh, so you know what? If it's a void pointer, are we going to have to pass? Are we going to have to make three different variations? I think we might need like a data I/O for each type in order to follow the garbage collector rules. Or would unsafe pointer be sufficient as far as like a void pointer substitute? Because I think a void pointer would be a uint pointer natively, which is not what we want. So I think we're actually going to need three separate copies of this. So that's unfortunate, but I think it, I don't think it can be avoided. Anyway, let's see let's see what kind of code this generates at first. But if it's if it's what I suspect, we're probably going to have to uh, paper or wallpaper around it a little bit. Um, let's bring the terminal back. Yep. What is this other terminal doing? I should close it by now. Yeah, I don't need it anymore. Okay. So now uh, we have a couple of more definitions we want to add. So internal uh, WGH stands for WireGuard Header. Uh, just a little package name I made up. We're going to run the generator. And so now we have a couple of new structures to play with. Okay, pointer to byte. Okay. Um, I mean, I guess that's technically true, but we're going to need some unsafe pointer coercions in there. Um did I get the did I get the interface I/O name wrong? Because if Cgo generates an empty struct, you usually got it wrong. So let's see. Wg underscore interface struct struct ah struct wg underscore interface I/O. Yeah. So if you get a if you get a name wrong, Cgo will generate an empty struct for you, which is not what you want. So uh, that was a that was a giveaway that something was incorrect. Generate once again. Um, C type struct WG PRIO. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to need to add that PRIO as well. Okay. Uh, type WG PRIO C dot struct WG PRIO. We're not going to use these for a while, but diff. Uh, allowed IPs IO. Okay. We need, I guess we got to do all of them, even if we're not going to use them for a while. Um, WG allowed AIPIO. I've been trying to stick to the C conventions for these, so I guess I should keep it struct uh, WG AIP IO. Then right. WG AIP cider. Okay.
Uh, by the way, so we're definitely getting into some, what I would say is pretty advanced, weird go stuff today. If anybody has any questions, you know, feel free to ask in the chat. Uh, don't, don't be intimidated. Yeah. You know, I'm super happy to answer questions and try and discuss this and explain it as well as I can. Uh, to be honest, like this is, uh, you know, this is pushing my, this sort of stuff pushes my boundaries too. So I'm, I'm happy to, happy to, uh, you know, share thoughts, um, you know, see what I can do to help educate everyone, you know, teach everyone how to understand these types of things. Um, okay. So I think we're in a place now where we have all the structures we are going to need, um, at least for now. So let's try doing a data IO with the interface IO, but a pointer to a pointer to a byte is like a pointer to a just a block of memory. So I guess if we cast the WG interface IO to to a byte array and then pass a pointer to the first element, that would still work. And because it's still a Go pointer, I just think it should work fine. So maybe I don't need the maybe I don't need to generate a type for each one. Um, if we have to, we can replace this. What I'm talking about right now is this mem field um, has a pointer to a byte type. We need to re retain the pointerness of this type in order for the garbage collector to recognize the pattern. So I was thinking we might have to make separate types for each of the IO types, like interface IO, peer IO, etc. but we might not have to. So I guess we'll see. Cool, so let's do our first data IO. Um, we specified the name of an interface, I assume. The size, uh, we don't actually know, so we're probably gonna have to do the IOCTL twice again um, because the kernel will tell us how much memory we need to allocate. And then we pass a pointer to an interface IO, which will be populated. Um, oh, wow, this is a, this is like a linked list. <laughs> that's gonna be, that's gonna be entertaining. Oh no, what have I done? This was, uh, I got, I got nerd sniped into doing this on stream today and now I'm a little afraid, <laughs> but it should be, it should be a pretty awesome time for sure. This is not the kind of thing you normally uh, see and go though, for sure. So this is, this is very unusual. Oh, what did I get myself into? Okay, um, right. So we're essentially going to do kind of a similar pattern to what we did up here. So we create the WG data structure, which is the data IO. So we create a var data uh, WGH uh, WG data IO, right? Um, I would expect that would work. The size is already zero because it's zero by default in Go. Um, so he's creating a few structures up front. We copy the name of the interface into the name field. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so data, let's see here. Uh, right. So the type of this WG data IO is name 16 byte. Okay, so we already have the device name. Yes, we do. Okay. D name error colon equals device name of name if error so name D name so now we have the name of the device Oops, what did I just do I think I hit control A we have the name of the device passed into this structure so now we need to pass this to an ioctal it's going to populate the size field and we're going to do the same pattern as before right um, do we have to populate the pointer I don't think so or let's see Redactyl realloc okay um so i guess let's make an actyl wrapper so Well, hey gang, uh, you know I just hit 101 followers. That's pretty cool. But you know I just really want to make it to uh, 110. So that'd be uh, that'd be pretty great. You know if I could make it to 110 followers today. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm sorry. I'll stop. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see here. Ioctal WG data IO because that is the type of structure we're going to be passing into it. Returns a function 
forms the appropriate actyl on FD to like, subscribe, and ring the bell. Yeah, heck yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't get any new followers from that plug, so I'm guessing that uh, everybody watching right now is probably following already, so that's okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'll just wait until I get an uh, affiliate and I can start asking for Twitch Prime subs. <laughs> like, hey, it's Amazon's money. It's not yours, so uh, spend it on me. Uh, okay. Um, WG data IO. This is going to return a function which takes a WG data IO. Okay, I'm back. Welcome. Yes, RWH WG data IO. This is that other IOCTL. I can get wire guard, I assume. Um, what are we up to? WG control for OpenBSD? Yes. Uh, so essentially we got to the point where we ripped out all the old code that wasn't working. We have a copy of the code now that can fetch the device names of WireGuard devices. So that part has not changed because that's a standard OpenBSD API. Um, excuse me. And now we're at the point where we are working on doing the first data IO, which should give us information about a device. So the goal is to get information about a device today. Uh, there's also peers and then allowed IPs for each peer. Um, I suspect it's gonna be mostly the same pattern, but that being said, it's gonna be, it's gonna take some time, especially to get right. Um, all right, really quick, I'm gonna go refill in water. I'll be back in just a minute or so. All right, we're back. Uh, let's see here. So this screen should be sleep 60,000 or something stream. Yeah, it probably should be. Um, I'll probably change up the uh, the stream, you know, the Go jokes on my AFK screens and such in a while. Because right now I've got Go stream and defer stream, and that's about it. Um, I was thinking maybe it would make sense to have like return or something, or I don't know. We'll see. Uh, how would you test the compat with an OpenBSD system? Are there OpenBSD containers even? Yes. Uh, so I'm actually, I am developing this on using SSHFS, but I have an OpenBSD VM running on my server that is right here. So this machine is OpenBSD. So I don't even know how you'd begin developing this sort of thing on Linux, unfortunately, you know. So I'm mounting the code over SSHFS, making edits, and then compiling it and running it here. So it seems to be working. Um, there might be an easier way. It sounds like uh, some of the folks who use Emacs and such have really nice workflows for this sort of thing. But uh, yeah, SSHFS seems okay. So we're going to stick with that. That's a sweet setup. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's working it's working all right so far. So just uh, doing what we can, you know. So we've got this WG data IO. Um, one sec. Let me... Friends... Uh... Friends bragging about their video game accomplishments, of course, you know. Uh, I was debating getting some afternoon coffee, too. It sounds kind of good, but it's Sunday. I probably shouldn't. I don't know. Um, okay. Returns a function which performs the appropriate actal on FD2. Issue a wire guard data IO. So really quick, it just occurred to me actually, um, for for those who are interested, if you've never done unsafe Go type stuff before, uh, on my blog, I have a blog called Unsafe Pointer and System Calls. This is should be pretty helpful. So today we're doing stuff that's like a little more advanced, but this kind of covers the basics and how the unsafe pointer stuff works in Go and all, like allowing you to do things like system calls. And I have also done a talk on the subject. Um, so if you check out the slides here, I did a conference talk on the subject last year at GoCon Canada, where I kind of covered this in a bit more detail. And there's also a video. Um, but yeah, you can find all that stuff here on my talks page. Uh, check it out. I'm super happy to, you know, discuss how this stuff works and try and give you the details. But ultimately, um, I've got a lot of stuff out there about this. So if you're interested, go check it out. And I've got tons of stuff on my website, so go check that out too. Right, so we need to do a data IO using the IOCTL interface, okay? 
So we populate the device name. Let's pull up the C code again and see what they're doing. So I think it was the same patterns before. We need to allocate enough memory. So let's let's do the let's do the IOCTL first and see what we get back. It's gonna tell us probably how many bytes we need to allocate. So right now we're not allocating anything. Uh, WG data IO. So if error colon equals C. Oh, we need to swap. So what I do too, um, in order to make this actually testable, I have these IOCTL functions that are swappable. So we're gonna do the same thing here. We're going to add a new function that is a func that takes a WGH data IO. And within the tests, we can manipulate it in a similar way to what the kernel would. Uh, so this is actually the best pattern I have discovered thus far for testing this sort of thing. Um, certainly, it's difficult to test with real IOCTLs. Like, I think I actually have some integration tests in here, too, somewhere. Um, actually, I do at the top level. I should get them running on OpenBSD for sure. Uh, once we, I think once we get the basics of this down, I will probably enable them on OpenBSD and try and set up a source hut VM with this kernel module if I can. I think the problem is, is that I'm not sure how we would get it installed uh, cleanly as of yet. I just don't know enough about OpenBSD, but we'll see. Uh, once again, thank you all for hanging out with me today. I'm having a really good time doing this. This is uh, certainly the ch challenging kind of project. Um, I enjoy doing this sort of stuff. So if you are interested and are enjoying it, uh, let me know. Feel free to suggest things for the future as well. We could probably do more, you know, unsafe stuff or possibly like an introductory unsafe thing if that was uh, of interest. Um, but yeah, I'm having a good time doing this. So thanks for hanging out. Octal WG data IO. We're going to pass a pointer to the data structure. So what I would expect now is that when we pass this pointer to the kernel, it's going to populate the length field or the size field and give us the data back. So print F percent plus V data. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I probably should have, what directory am I in? Yeah, I probably should have a couple different terminals open for this actually. I can just SSH into it twice. So command WG control go. Command WG control. Uh, kernel, nope. Oh, this is the uh, K shell, isn't it? There we go. Kernel. Uh, was it? Okay, we can, we, that's fine. Uh, WG control, open BSD kernel equals one. I guess I could put this in my environment, couldn't I? Like in my bash RC. Bash RC. <laughs> oh boy. I'm not using BI, that's not happening. <laughs> I am, uh, I am not worthy of such things. You know, it's funny, even when I was a Vim user, like there was enough stuff that was different with VI where I couldn't use it either. So I, uh, I'm, I'm no good. Z shell though, yeah. I, I use Z shell for a number of years. These days I just use bash. Um, I don't know, and okay, cool. So now it's in the environment. Panic, awesome. Um, oh, you know what? We forgot to assign the function to the constructor, right? So the problem is here is that we're calling a nil function. So ioctl wg did ioft. Yep. So the way that I'm doing this is whenever the client's invoked, we create the socket, we pass in the file descriptor so it's enclosed over in these calls, and then these functions are all swappable now using a using this uh, interface. So I like this. I feel like this is a good pattern. I, I probably should write up something on this. I kind of wanted to do a well, so first, I guess I should do a blog on like advanced unsafe pointer because the the one I did before was more of the basics. I think doing an advanced unsafe pointer blog would be useful. And also, I'd love to propose it as like a conference talk. But the problem is, is that I had a fairly hard time getting the basic one accepted as well, I suspect, because it's pretty unusual content. So I suspect advanced unsafe pointer would be pretty difficult to get into a conference unless it was a very large, you know, like multi-track, like a GopherCon US maybe. But we'll see. I'll, I'll probably write it up at some point and propose it. It is quite niche. Yeah, exactly. Uh, cool. Hey, so looking at this over here, so it worked. We have the name, so WG0, I assume. Size 88. So 88 bytes of memory is how much it's expecting us to pass it. I wish there were conferences that focused on experts, not just pandering to newbies. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I have, I've talked in the past how I wish that at GopherCon, like if I had the option to sit through a, you know, a, a 
a four part one hour long session each session on like the compiler or the garbage collector like i would totally do that you know and like go go novices are not so interested in that sort of thing of course um but i personally would love to have something like that so i suspect there is an audience for it i just have no idea how large the audience is and what it would take to actually get something like that to happen you know So we need to give it 88 bytes of memory and it's going to give us some stuff. So the bytes of memory in this case are, I'm guessing this WG interface IO is probably 88 bytes in length. So. IFIO, uh, WG interface IO. Yep, 6464, 3264, yeah, okay. So I'm guessing we're gonna get the keys and everything parsed pretty quickly here. We're gonna get so something something workable, which is pretty cool. Um, right, so we have this structure. We need to pass a pointer to it to the kernel. So we need to, yeah, widening the community is one thing, deepening it is another. You could always try organizing one. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it would be pretty cool to organize a conference. I'm in Michigan, so I suspect uh, it might be hard for me. <laughs> but yeah, maybe. I mean, there are 100 subscribers in that stream. That's enough for a conference. Yeah, that's totally true. I mean, the thing is, is the conference doesn't have to be 1,000 people, right? So I went to, oh, one sec, check this out. You ready for this? I went to ah it's hard to it's hard to hold this up. I went to Rust Belt Rust uh, that was held here in Ann Arbor. It was a small Rust conference, like maybe I don't know, maybe 50, 70, 100 people, um, and it was great. And it was uh, you know it was all all levels of skill and everything, but it was actually a really great time. And it was it was a smaller conference. It only needed to be one day, single track. That was fine. I suspect that, you know, if we wanted to do like a super experienced Go conference, you know, it could be sort of a similar thing. Um, <laughs> nothing happening IRL anytime soon, unfortunately. Yeah, true. Online, yeah, you know, we could, it would be interesting to organize an online event. Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even care about like, I guess I don't know what it would take, but like I personally wouldn't even care about like charging a mission or anything, you know, as far as I'm concerned, like whoever wants to show up can show up or, we could live stream it on YouTube, you know, and just do like a Zoom call. That could be really cool, actually. So it's a good idea. <laughs> the entire Rust user base was there. Uh, yeah, say that to the uh, however many thousand subscribers they have on Reddit and the uh, the Hacker News people. Rust is super cool. We should do a Rust stream. I, uh, I want to get back into my, I want to look at my compiler again I wrote. That was pretty fun. Um, So what we need to do now is we're going to take this WG interface IO and reinterpret it as bytes uh, by passing the first. No, we need to wait a sec. We need to. Okay. So now we have this back. I wouldn't mind watching you write rust. Uh, yeah, I am very rusty. No pun intended, honestly. Uh, but that could be pretty cool. Um, the thing is, is that the project I did is mostly done and I don't think I'm like good enough to like give a rust stream. Otherwise I could give like a beginner stream, but there was actually a really great rust streamer. Um, one sec. So I don't know if he's on Twitch or not actually, but he is. One sec. He does streams on YouTube for sure. So, uh, I'll, I'll bring us up to over here. Uh, John Jengset, I'm sorry, I don't know how to his last name. Uh, John is amazing. He actually, like, will take stuff from his viewers and he's like, okay, uh, let's implement an asynchronous SSH create for Rust. And he just does that over the course of, like, a few hour stream. Um, he's very, very good at what he does. He does a good job explaining things. I would highly recommend his channel if you are Rust curious. So. Okay, now we need to populate this so we know how many bytes we have. It's expecting 88 bytes. Right. Ryan Levick is good too. Okay, I've never heard of him, but I'll have to, I'll have to check him out. So what's this doing? This is checking the, it doesn't like octal. 
size is greater than or equal to last size it breaks. Allocates memory. And then it's interpreting that memory as the interface. Okay, so that's essentially what I was gonna do as well. So we can, I guess probably the safer way to do this is to We're going to make a byte slice that is of the length specified. So data len, was it len or size? Size, data size. Uh, we're going to pass a pointer to the first. So now that we have the data, we're going to do the same ioctal again um, by passing a pointer to it within the structure. So data dot mem equals an unsafe pointer uh, it needs to be a pointer to, excuse me, a pointer to a byte, which is going to be, actually, does this, does this work? Is that good enough? Is that, is that a, is that a pointer to a pointer to a byte? That might work, right? I mean, prob probably not. I'm pro I think I'm, I'm pretty rusty on doing this kind of stuff, honestly, but that works. I'd be surprised. Okay. Um, apparently that compiled and worked. So we have data. That should work. Cool. Okay. Well, so no unsafe pointer trickery needed. It was just a was the first address of a element of memory. So now we can take that structure and we can reinterpret it as the IFIO. So um, let's see here. Do we need to worry about... Okay. So IFIO equals a WGH WG interface IO converting from an unsafe pointer that we're also going to have to, so we're converting from unsafe pointer, data mem is already a pointer. So data mem we convert to an unsafe pointer, which we convert to a WG interface IO and finally we dereference, okay? So what we wanna do next is verify the size. So to be safe, whenever you're casting like this, you want to verify that your structures are the right sizes. So size of uh, WG interface IO equals C dot size of struct WG interface IO. We want to verify that we're casting into, when we're doing an unsafe cast, you have to check the sizes of both the types or else you could possibly uh, expose uninitialized memory or um, what's the reverse? Expose uninitialized memory or have memory that's kind of just like not being seen at all. So you have to be really careful. Um, so what we're gonna do first is verify that, so if uh, we need to regenerate the code, one sec, generate. Okay, is that 88 bytes on AMD64? I'm guessing it is, 0x58. So what was it yesterday? Uh, BC uh, I base equals, <laughs> Here we go. See if I can remember Michael's little lesson. Uh, in base equals 16, O base equals 10, uh, 0x58. 0x58. Uh oh. I forgot how to do it. 58. Well, okay, I give up. <laughs> 0x58 in decimal. 88. It's perfect. That's uh, okay. That's exactly what we want. O base before I base. O base equals 10, I base equals 16, 58. Ah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I remember you saying yesterday that uh, I think I base overwrites O base, right? So cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. We got 88 bytes. So as we can see, the kernel told us we need to give it 88 bytes. It turns out a WGH interface IO is exactly 88 bytes. So now as a result, we're able to uh, unsafe cast it safely or in a deterministic way, rather. So if len uh, wg, oh, I base influences how O base is interpreted. It interpreted your 10 in hex base 16 instead of decimal, yep. Oh, okay, so it's, the, it's, the, it's that the 10 in O base would be interpreted according to your I base. I see, okay, that makes, that makes sense. It feels like kind of an odd behavior, but I guess potentially that could be useful, I don't know. Uh, if len, let's see, 
len data not equals to to size of so wh dot size of wg interface io we can move this check up here grind nil f It's arguably consistent. Any number you input is affected by iBase. Yeah, I, I suppose that's true. I think it's consistent, but uh, perhaps not beginner friendly. <laughs> Print F percent plus V, IFIO. All right, let's see what this interface IO is giving us. Um, we are invalid argument data for when. Oh, len mem, not len data, len mem. Kernel returned unexpected number of bytes. Okay, so as we can see there, we have a public and private field, important such. So if I go find the docs for this, I'm pretty sure we just got this working, at least the very basics. Um, one sec, WireGuard BSD. Yes, so what we are trying to do now, or what we're going to do is, so this is, this is what I'm looking at, by the way. Um, one sec. Oh no! Shoot! Sorry, this is uh, this is the wrong repo. Get zx2. So this is this is the old repo location. I want the new one. So zx2 c4. So this repo is now hosted on uh, Jason's upstream WireGuard uh, Git repositories and such. So uh, right. So what we do here is we use if config to create. A device with a private key, port, etc. So we're going to configure some of these things really quick, so we can get a device that has some configuration that we can parse out. So, uh, if config, uh, do we have wg? No, we don't. So, wg gen key. So this is a private key. Uh, clearly, I'm not going to use this for anything. So don't get any ideas. But <laughs> um, if config wg zero wg key. Uh, hello? Uh-oh. Did I wedge it? Uh, yeah, I appear to have lost the uh, VM. <laughs> Oops. Um, I just, did I just find a bug? Huh. I wonder if I put it into an inconsistent state. Maybe, yeah. Oops. Uh, all right, well, we're going to... We're gonna give this an old, old reboot off of uh, Vert Manager here. Um, okay. Check serial of the VM. Yeah, one sec. Uh, yeah, there we go. Attempted to access user address in supervisor mode, kernel, page fault, trap, WG, IOCTL set. Uh, so is this a, <laughs> is this a bug in the kernel module or a bug in my code? Because actually I don't think I, I don't think I specified Bug in the kernel module, I think. Yeah, could be. Uh, okay, I guess I will take a screenshot of this. If user space can crash the kernel, that's a kernel bug. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, cool. What an exciting stream. We uh, we found a bug in a kernel module. Uh, to be fair, to be fair though, this is a uh, pretty new thing, right? This was on your if config. Uh, yes, I just wondered if I put the kernel module in some kind of inconsistent state. Um, but yes, this was on my if config. Uh, so I hope we don't have to write screen shut. Hope we don't have to stop working on this, but we might be running out of, uh, we might be stuck, unfortunately. Um, select an area to grab. I'm going to report this like a good user. 
Okay. Uh, cool. Well, let's give this a reboot and try again. So, force reset. Boot. Please come up. Okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good day, isn't it? Uh, okay. Oh. Ah. Ter shift that. Can you grab me a backtrace also? Oh, sorry. I rebooted already. Um, I guess I don't know what you mean by backtrace on OpenBSD. I have no idea. I've never had to debug anything like this before. But, I mean, in theory, we can replicate it again, right? So give me give me a sec here. So... Uh, right. Oh, that's right. It doesn't have IP. Okay. So if config wg0 create... Uh, if config wg0 wg key. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, just enter trace in the DDB prompt on the serial after it crashes. Okay. Sounds good. Shall we? Uh, yep. Same problem. Okay. Well, I guess we might have pulled this on a bad day, unfortunately. Okay, uh, trace. Okay, cool. Uh, so if I send this information to the author, it should be helpful. Yeah, I would imagine. Bug reporting criteria in general. Okay, let's take a quick look at that. Um, Type PS. Oh, so this is like an entire shell. So I'm taking a look over here at the instructions. So you should get a trace from each processor as part of your report. Debugger just says FPS. Okay. Capture the PS too. Uh, I'm not sure I can capture the whole PS, unfortunately, unless I do like several screenshots. Show panic, trace uh, machine. Can you redirect serial to file? Uh, yeah, I guess I, I think I could actually. Um, that's a that's a QNU option, right? Um, libvirt, yeah, right. Let me, okay, let's turn it off. Um, right. So, serial, PTY. Do I want to... I'm, so I've never done this before, so we're gonna be having, we're gonna be having a good time together. Um, ISA serial. Let's see here, so libvirt serial to file. I'm pulling up some docs on a different screen. I apologize. I, one sec. Have you ever been in touch with the OpenBSD developer community to debug something or propose a new thing? Uh, no. So I am not really an OpenBSD community member. I am doing this because I develop a WireGuard library and I wanted to try and get it working with the OpenBSD module. Uh, the kernel module is still out of tree. So I suspect this is perhaps to be expected or, you know, it's just being worked on, right? Um, but I do not, I've never worked on any OpenBSD development, so. Serial type equals file. Okay. So I can add a file serial device. Let's see if I can do that within the, without adding XML. <laughs> Unix socket, I'll do a file. Perfect. Okay. Um. You might like them. They do some cool stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I have, I have, you know, tons of respect for, you know, of course, projects like OpenSSH and etc. Um, are there WireGuard people in touch with the OpenBSD if they're developing out of tree? Do you know what the expectations are? Yes, I assume so. Uh, so I have not been following the development of this module closely, but my understanding is that the author is in touch with them. So OpenBSD.txt. 
Okay. Serial two. So will it output to both serial consoles or should I remove the first one? I guess we can just find out, right? But uh, yeah, okay. Boot. All right, give me just a moment to dig around in my server and see if I can get into where that file is. CD, CMU, domain 6, W, Okay. Have the monitor socket. I don't see where the serial output would be. Um, I didn't specify an absolute path, so I'm guessing it's somewhere under verlib libbert, but I don't actually see it. Um, I suppose we can pull this up really quick. Pull this back up one sec. Where's my OBS scene? There we go. Okay. Uh, where would this serial file live? Ver oh, verlog maybe? Uh, oh, the XML should, it looks like the XML should have a location for it, maybe. wgopenbsd.txt. So is that relative to where Libert is running? Or Kimu? Let's put it, I'll, I'll put it under temp or something. That seems like a more sane uh, option, right? So. Uh, no. One sec. Force off. Remove. Yes. Serial to a file that lives under temp wg openbsd dot text. Finish. Okay. Uh, serial console should be going to ls slash temp wg tail. Uh, hello? Nothing. Hmm. Is the serial not going to both outputs? Is that the problem here? Do I need to remove the the terminal serial output? Or maybe there's a kernel parameter I can configure? Huh. Target port equals one. Port zero, port one, yeah. Okay, um, let's try, I guess let's try re rearranging the order of these devices really quick or something, right? Um, hang on a sec, can I edit the XML directly in here? Be nice. <laughs> Editing XML directly, what a, what a time to be alive, huh? Where are the preferences where I can edit the XML? Only enable if you know what you're doing. Yes, understood. Um, preferences, okay, there we go. XML editing, there we go. Great, so I'm going to try and swap it so that this is port zero and this is port one assuming that is the, uh, did that not save? I don't think it did, did it? Port one, port zero. It's not taking effect. Oh, do I need to click apply down below probably? Yeah, I do, okay. Apply. I assume it's only going to be sending data on the first TTY. Yeah, that's my guess as well. That's why I'm changing this to uh, zero really quick just to see what happens. So now we should see, oh, tail dash F, right? Yeah. I expect we'll see the console output over here. Maybe not. Capital F, so it notices truncations. Okay, sure. Hmm. 
Doesn't seem to be working still. Nothing. Oh, no kidding. QMU UI serial monitor. One can select text, choose copy, and then paste it somewhere else. Not sure if you have access. I don't know. So this is Vert Manager right here is what I'm using. Um, take a screenshot. Send key. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I'm running this through Libvert. Um, what was the error it said when you selected text console one? Uh, nothing. Just nothing showed up, unfortunately. So. Or serial one. Oh, I see. So when I do that, I usually do something like script to record everything, then run verse console start. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I guess that would work, wouldn't it? Text console one. Oh, right. Active console session exists for this domain. I could try it over the CLI. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. So let's uh, let's put this back the way that was the way that it was. Um, um let's see. No graphic command is what makes the UI disappear. Right. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm getting having nightmares over here. I remember dealing with some of this stuff for like trying to uh, trying to work on the VSOC devices before I had support for them with Libvert and everything was just like a huge pain in the neck. Like awful, awful, awful. Okay, so this domain is now powered down. Um, let's see here. Cancel. So now we want versh list, uh, versh start. WG OpenBSD. Oh no, I want script first, don't I? So let me one sec. One moment. Temp. Um, okay. So now verse start WG OpenBSD. Or no, script. Versh start WG open BSD and then verse console. Versh console WG open BSD. I'm guessing the output is being redirected elsewhere. Well, I can probably SSH into the VM, so. Yep. What's your serial config again? I changed it back to the defaults. Uh, oh gosh, where is, where is the square break on my Kinesis? There we go. <laughs> um, uh, exit, right, remove TypeScript. Verse edit, ah. <laughs> Editing a, uh, editing libvert XML is not how I expected this day to go. Oh, let's see here, serial. Um, serial type equals PTY. So this is the this is the serial config we have before. Console type equals PTY. Target type equals serial port zero. Is there like a is there like a no graphic setting I could put in here or something? I can never remember how to deal with the XML stuff, unfortunately. Um, what a day! Uh, verse output to well, let's see. Verse console. (laughs) 
console equals tty as zero in the vms kernel line and grub.conf that's for linux so so serial type equals pty console type equals pty serial port zero so apparently this should be mostly correct i think i just need to configure the vm to use it right so is there a command line i can tell open bsd to output to serial um bsd enable serial console because I know in Linux, at least, you specify the console parameter and it can specify like TTY S0, something like that. So, uh, etsy boot.conf. Okay. Um, use the first serial port as your console. All right, let's give that a go. Why not? Right? Um, Verse start wg openbsd. Oh. Set tty com o. Find baud rate. Uh, how would you suggest getting started with Go? Uh, not like this, <laughs> for sure. Um, so actually, there is a really great book called. Oh, okay, cool. I'll check that out in just a sec here. Um, there is a really great book called the Go Programming Language. Uh, GoPL.io is the website. Uh, I think this is an awesome book for learning Go. It's by a couple of folks who are very well respected in the Go and programming communities in general. Um, also, just you know, find a project, find something that interests you. You know, build a way a web API or something. You know, those are all very cool ways to get started with it. So that's my recommendation. Okay, I'm pulling up that link. Oh, cool. Okay, so you've got a whole XML file here. Okay. Uh, yeah, it looks like my serial and console parameters are quite similar. So I would suspect something like this maybe should work, you know? Um, I guess we'll see. Uh, reboot. Okay. So first console wg openbsd. Uh, I guess first let's script just in case. And reboot. Hey, look at that. That looks like that's uh, working to me. Cool. We did good. Thank you all for the uh, the libvert help and everything. Um, yeah. Looking good, looking good. So now we need to SSH in and crash it again. So we can WG open BSD. Um, are there any commands I could be running here that would be useful? Um, hmm. I guess I'll also capture the output of my SSH session down here. So, need to go back to, what do you call it? Um, WireGuard open BSD. All right, so we're gonna create a device. Um, shoot, macros, um, there we go. Send a link to your YouTube video. Yeah, no way. I know what would happen if a user sent me a three hour long YouTube video and, and a bug report. I'd be pretty annoyed. So, to zero, create, if config, wg0, if config, wg0, wg key. This is a key nobody else is going to ever see. There we go. Okay. So now we have this on the console. So we can run whatever commands we want. So we want trace. We want. Uh, do we care about the per CPU state? I saw there was something about the OpenBSD troubleshooting guide said like capture it for each CPU. Right? You should get a trace from each processor as part of your report. So this is an SMP system. The VM has four cores. So. Okay, uh, we got the panic right there. Let's get a trace. 
Uh, and then machine DDB CPU one. Oops, machine DDB CPU two. Oh, CPU zero probably is what I wanted, right? Of course. Oh, there we go. Okay. Funny, my instinct would have been to change the VM to a single core. <laughs> uh, cool. And then trace. All right. Uh, I believe with that, we are probably in good shape to send a bug report. So, cool. Exit. Oh, uh, yeah, it's got some weird serial console stuff, but... I imagine this should still be pretty useful for him. So, man, it's too many cores anyway. Yeah. Uh, LS dash R, or less dash R, piped into cat of the file. Not sure what that will do, actually. Oh. Uh, I'm not sure what you're trying to get me to do, Michael, but. So now we can get out of this VM. We can SCP from, so I thought there was a way to strip those control characters. Yeah, maybe. Um, let's see here. So make dir temp. Um, SCP from the server. Temp wg open bsd type script uh wire guard g open bsd crash dot text okay sweet uh cool i will send this along to the wire guard folks uh where did my windows go there we go see i wonder if putting this in like a gist will do anything useful right i mean this is going to be gross but bsd crash suppose we could try to oops. ah the light it's blinding I really should get a light for behind my camera because I know my light is not great when I go back to like terminals. But anyway, um, yeah. AMD Epic processor. Yeah, I wish. Fire <laughs> guard. Open BSD crash. Trace. Reproduction steps. Serial console and trace. DB trace. Okay. Close, close, close. Is there a second chat I'm not aware of? Uh no. So I'm in a I'm in a channel with some of the WireGuard developers. Um so I'm gonna report it there.
Not that I really care about this being seen, but I'll just, uh, doesn't need to be listed on my public GitHub either. Cool. I think the author of this code lives in Australia. I have no idea what time it is right there, right there right now, but I suspect it's quite late or quite early. So probably gonna not be able to do any more on this today, but we can at least write a couple of tests or something, right? So I start updating the 6 a.m. in Sydney. Yeah, probably, probably not gonna happen. Feels good. We did we did a good thing. So here is the here's what I just sent to the the WireGuard folks. Um, yeah, can't complain about that. So I think we did we did a good thing today. You know, hopefully I hope we can do a little bit more development work. I guess, but if nothing else, we can always work on a different project or, or something. I don't know. Um, coming up in about three hours now. Um, I'm still feeling pretty good. So. Are you recording your streams? Yes, I am. Uh, they are all going to YouTube, actually. So if I... I don't think I have a short link yet, but maybe I can make one. I guess I'm not sure. How do you make a short link for your YouTube channel? Because right now it's just some, like, UUID. But that would be that would be nice if I could make a short link. So like YouTube slash C slash MD layer. Uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, one sec, I can I, I'll I'll grab the link off my website. I can at least post what I have right now. Um, MD layer .com. talks no about about right uh, recordings of streams. So right here. So this gobbledygook. Um, that's what I have today, but I will try and get a short link going as well. Um, let's, let's figure that out really quick. So YouTube short link channel, custom channel URL. Okay. I need to have 100 or more subscribers be at least 30 days old, have uploaded photo and uploaded channel art. Okay. So. I need 92 more subscribers on YouTube. So uh, <laughs> let me know if you all, you know, subscribe. That'd be appreciated. Uh, yeah, cool. So nothing I can do about that today. But how many times have I said, uh, yeah, cool, on this stream? I, uh, I think it's one of those things I just say kind of out of habit. Like, all right, cool, you know, pretty good. <laughs> so... Uh, let's bring the VM back up, and if nothing else, we can at least... Oh, it's hung, isn't it? Let's bring the VM back up. If nothing else, we can... Vert Manager. Vert Manager. If nothing else, we can write a little bit more Go code and get some tests on it, and then I'll feel pretty good about it, you know? Uh, is this hung, or is the networking not working? Hello? Reset. Switching console to com zero. Ah, right. Right, right, right. Give me my SSH. It's funny seeing things on the uh, the Twitch stream over on the right. It looks like we're like five or six seconds delayed at least. There we go. Okay. See, this is why, you know, nobody needs net tools, right? So the other day I uninstalled net tools from my system. So if I try an if config, it doesn't even work anymore. You know, get rid of net tools. Nobody needs it, right? <laughs> if 
config WGO. Okay. Um, I wonder if there's anything else we can do. I mean, I guess we can, we could try setting a different field maybe like the, the port, um, if config, that also crashes. Okay. I think there's just something wedged with this build, unfortunately. So, we'll do what we can with the basic interface. So, I suspect we're not going to be able to fetch a whole lot of useful information because it's all going to be zeros, but we can at least see what it would look like, right? And hopefully, um, well, so today is Sunday. I probably will not stream again until next Saturday or next Sunday. Um, I don't expect to do Saturday, Sunday every weekend, but when I have nothing going on, I'm happy to stream, you know, so. Hello, there we go. Okay. Um, groups WG. Yep. As we'd expect. Right. Let's go back to the code. Let's go back to the, the project. So how long did it take us to troubleshoot that? Was that a half hour, 40 minutes? I don't know. Um, I'm going to switch to sitting mode as well. Really quick. One sec. Uh, cool. Okay. So, uh, let's see here. What can I do next? So I think probably a good next step would be to maybe write some tests for this. I mean, I think we can verify, uh, bash go run main dot go. Yes. Okay. So we have this structure, but it has nothing associated because we can't set anything without crashing the kernel. <laughs> Oops. Uh, to be clear, I don't mean any of this is like an indictment of the quality of that code or anything. Um, just it happens, you know. This this happens with pre-production software. It, it's the way it is, you know. I uh, I get it. It's not a problem, you know. It's not gonna ruin my it's not gonna ruin my stream or anything. So, what are you gonna do? But we reported the bug. We did a good thing. So I'm I'm happy about that for sure. Dominic says, 20 minutes ago, don't forget to update static check regularly. I'm steadily ironing out bugs. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, even, even static check has bugs. <laughs> okay. Um, what can we unpack from this? Flags, peers, port, R table, routing table? Does OpenBSD support multiple routing tables? I guess I'm not sure. I guess I'll refresh my stream manager and see if it's any less far behind. It seems like it's... Yes, OpenBSD supports multiple routing tables. Okay. Okay, I think my I think my stream is... Or my stream manager got behind somehow. But, okay, that would make sense. I don't think we exposed that in the API, so we don't have to care about that. But we have the port, which I would suspect is the listening port... Um, the peers, which we can't really do anything with right now, and then the public and private keys. So we can we can parse those at least, right? So oh shoot, this is all on SSHFS, which has now been uh wedged a few times, right? So let's see here. Da, 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 da. Let's go fix my SSHFS. Yes. Okay, we're back. Um, we can unpack a few of the structures, as mentioned. So we can do... We can get the port. We can get the public and private keys. So it's not going to work. Yeah, I think that a lot of the VS Code stuff is going to be a little wedged because of we're working on code for a different OS. So the listen port. Uh, 
uh, name type private public listen port. Okay. Private key. Public key. Listen port. IFIO dot port. The, let's see here. So 32, an array of 32 bytes. I'm pretty sure the WG key type I have is also an array of 32 bytes. Okay, cool. Um, I should be able to cast that directly, right? So just WG types key over IFIO dot public and WG types key over IFIO dot private. I would expect something like this to work, right? I mean, cannot use IFIO port unit 16. Yep, okay, that's fair. Uh, cool, okay. Um, we are successfully, from what I can tell, at least parsing the data. Awesome. Problem is we can't verify it with the kernel module at the moment. We could at least write tests, right? But then the problem is, is that we're, our tests aren't really going to do a whole lot other than... Hmm. Well, I think it's probably still valuable anyway, right? But this is probably a good place to checkpoint this. Okay, here's a so here's a question... So this data, this slice here has been populated by the kernel. Do I need to make a copy of this? Is there any kind of like weird memory aliasing going on here? Uh, honestly, I'm just a little bit like foggy about this sort of stuff anymore. But do I need to copy anything out? Especially like these private and public keys. These are arrays. So data mem, we're just reinterpreting it as an interface I.O., but mem still exists, so mem is still in use from the perspective of the garbage collector, right? So I think this might be okay, but I'm honestly not totally sure. So if anybody has any insight, that'd be appreciated. So let's do a couple of comments. So first, um, specify the name of the device and determine how much memory must be allocated. Interface. We can close this for now, we don't need it. Sort of the interface. Allocate the appropriate amount of memory and point the kernel at the first bite of our slices backing backing array. I guess we should move this sanity check up here before we allocate any memory. And it's kind of funny. There was a there was a talk I did at a GopherCon GopherCon US where I was like validate before you allocate because otherwise it's just a total waste of time to allocate that memory, right? If this check would never succeed anyway. So if data size does not equal uh, the size of an interface I/O, then we know something is wrong. So, and we can actually test for this condition as well. Sure, we don't cast into uninitialized memory. We don't unsafe cast. From the same actle again to populate mem with a WG interface IO bytes for a WG interface IO. I'm surprised Dominic didn't say anything about my static check joke. I wonder if he's uh wonder if he's gone. No, I still see him in chat, but Okay, um, to do, unpacking of peers allowed IPs, etc. Which one that it has bugs too? Yeah, totally. I was calling you out. <laughs> you sent the you sent the streamer a broken build. You're trying to trying to jinx my stream. <laughs> oh, sweet. Okay. Yeah, nothing. I expect we won't hear anything else about the wire guard stuff for today, but that's okay. You know, it's been, it was still uh, educational, right? 
So now I want to write some tests for this. So I think probably what we're going to do is go back to full screen and we're going to simulate this in a similar way to what I did before. So basically the number of times the function is invoked will determine what operation we do. So the first operation is going to be populating size. The second operation is going to be populating memory using an unsafe cast, which will be fun. So I'm just glad that so far static check has never deleted someone's code. Oh, that's great. I mean, in theory, you're using version control, but I know that myself and probably some others too don't use version control for the first little bit of a project, at least. Um, it's kind of funny. I remember, I remember back in my PHP days, you know, like people would just SCP or SFTP files up to servers, like, you know, no problem. Like just different, there's just a different version of something running in there that might not be in version control. I mean, no problem. Uh, plus, you probably run static check for committing. Uh, I do not, as you know. I tend to forget. <laughs> but you're right. That's true. Cool. Um, yeah, this is going to be kind of the same style. Oh, right. So test client devices is actually going to be just fine. I had so many copies of folders of projects when I did PHP on Windows as a 14-year-old. <laughs> Experimental change, better make a copy. Yeah. Um, you know what? My, It's so funny. I was going to say my first foray with open source, but that's not true. But I remember doing school assignments, and we used Dropbox as version control because our college didn't teach us how to use, like, Git or anything. We took, in computer science too, we did, like, one day on SVN and then, like, never touched it again. And we just didn't have to use version control for the first, like, three years of school. It was just insane. So I learned Git on my own, and it's like, wow, you know, why isn't everything in a Git repository and fix that problem? But it was unbelievable. Should use RCS. Yeah, no, thanks. <laughs> no, thank you. Rainbow Comic Sans. Oh, of course. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm going to get some more water. I'll be back again in a sec. All right, here we go. Uh, my first programming was an MS Access VBA. Just kept a bunch of copies of the database. Oh wow. Yep, that uh, that sounds about right. <laughs> so where do we where do we live off of these tests? Um, I think we could probably say goodbye to the VM for today. Um, oh no, that's not true. We need the VM to run tests, don't we? <laughs> Oops. Anyway. Yeah, no problem. I wish I could run OpenBSD IOCTL tests on my on my own machine. That'd be a nice one. That I probably could actually run most of these tests, um, like with the IOCTL functions here and swapping out stuff. But mm. there there are improvements to be made to the test system for sure. Okay, uh, nil pointer d reference. Oh, it's a very fun thing to see immediately. Um, where is the line number? Oh, 117. Okay. Cool. Uh, ah, did I forget to assign this? Oh, I forgot to assign it in the test. Right, right, right. Okay. So this test here calls for device basic. I feel like we should do the one device test first, probably. Although, I mean, they're gonna have to be the same no matter what. But yeah, let's do the one device test first. I think that's just gonna be a little easier. So for the time being, we don't wanna run this. Actually, you know what I can just do, right? I could just like lowercase, oh no, I never want to debug the test. No, that's not, that's not what I wanna do with VS Code. Never, never, ever, ever. I can just lowercase it because like now it's not recognized as a test function, so it's not run. So, cool. Ooh, excuse me. I feel like I probably slurred my words a little bit there. Uh, haven't been having any beer yet today, don't worry. But A beer does sound pretty nice though, for sure. The problem is as soon as I have like a drop of like alcohol, I have no interest in being productive for the rest of the day, you know? That's just me anyway. is a function which accepts a WGH data IO data data IO error. Yep. 
return errors.new not implemented. Let's make sure the tests don't panic and then fix them. Oh, WG data IO. Yep. Perfect. So now we have to essentially do what we were doing above. And so it's a similar sort of idea to this. We, we're gonna steal most of this code because we're doing the same idea. The basic idea is the iOctal is invoked twice. iOctal, excuse me, it's invoked twice in the same function. And we need the ability to differentiate the calls. So we're going to pass in like this, uh, an integer that tracks the number of calls. Error calls int, right? Uh, so we inform the caller that we have n. Where does n come from? Oh, no, there is no n in here. So we have one. We're always going to have one device available. So we inform the caller that we have however many device names available. So we inform the caller that we have uh, an, in an interface IO structure available. So we are taking the memory, so data size equals, uh, data size, right? Yep, data size is going to equal the size of, size of WG interface IO, because we're telling the caller that they need to give us this much memory in order for us to populate it. Yep, um, verify the caller is asking for wire for card interface group members. That doesn't apply here. We wanna verify that they're asking for the right name though, for sure. So we wanna check that uh, data name is equal to, don't I have a helper down here for, yeah, dev name. Yep. It's equal to the dev name of device. So unexpected interface name. So every time this test is called, it should always be asking for data for test WG zero. Yep. And then on number one, we are going to populate the structure, uh, populate the pointer so they give us a pointer to a byte and we're going to do an unsafe assignment for a wg interface io <laughs> this is this is one of my favorite little tricks um i think we're at the point where i can i can close this and i can work without it uh what did i change yes i guess we'll find out that's what version control is for right um let's see here 116 n. Yep, no, there is no n. So we are going to reinterpret data mem as an unsafe pointer, and we are going to cast it to a pointer to a single WG interface IO. And then from there, we are able to do an assignment. So what we're doing, because the unsafe pointer call is on the left hand side of the assignment, we are able to directly assign a structure on the right hand, but it will be laid out in its byte form. So that's pretty cool. Nice little nice little trick for occasions like this. So the interface IO has some data. I guess we'll, we'll bring this back for now. Um, the interface IO has some data we care about, such as private key, public key, and port for now. Okay, so uh, port elite, of course, right? Um, not declared. Oh, sorry, that's a VS code messing with me. Too many calls to IOctal WG data IO. Yes. Okay. So port 1337. Oh, no, what do we do for? Okay, so port 8080. This is where we should probably reuse the uh, existing test data. So private and public. Okay. Private, public, listen port. We have this test fixture data already. Let's continue using it. So port 8080, yep. Uh, private, what's it called? Private key? Private key, private public, okay. Private is going to be priv. Do you have the IOctal call? Oh, I, I got a message in the, uh, sorry, I got a message in the uh, WireGuard channel. I guess that's the right one.
Um, what's the name of the Iactal? Cool. So it looks like somebody is uh, taking a look at the crash report already. That's awesome. Good to hear. Uh, private and public. Yep. Uh, no peers for now. So does this pass already? Yes, it does. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. But I can't run this test locally now. I could generate a cover coverage report, though, and pull it up in the browser. So we can do that at least. Um, let's see here. So go test. Dash cover, um, dash cover, profile, cover, dot, out, dot. 27% of statements, really? See, I feel like we should have more than that. WG OpenBSD. Where is the coverage profile? Um, did I lose SSHFS? I'm pretty sure I'm in the right directory. Oh, okay, that was weird. Uh, go tool cover. Where is this going to come up? Oh, over there. Okay. One moment. There we go. So now we can see the coverage report. So, right. So what we've got right now is we have the basic test cases covered here. This function was commented out, but we need to bring it back. Uh, we should probably verify this case because this would be a very big problem if we were able to bypass this. So we'll do that as well. Cool. So far, so good. Uh, yeah, thank you all for hanging in there. So, how's how's it going? I see we're we're down a few people. You know, it's been a it's been kind of a long day. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions or anything, or you know, if I'm if anything isn't clear, you know, please do ask. I'm happy to happy to share information. So, we need a case for this device where the data size is wrong. Definitely, that's that's a good idea. So, I'm surprised I didn't have that for. So, public. Pub is not used, but peer and PSK are not used. At least not yet. Okay. Device does not exist. I guess we haven't seen what happens if we query for a device that doesn't exist with the IOCTL, right? Or... Yeah, because we've tried to perform a WG data IO on it. So, okay, let's if config WG1. No such interface. Okay. Um, what's the air now for that? Echo. Is this tool, does the air now tool exist on BSD? Nope. I'm guessing there's probably, what is it, man7 airno? Or man airno? Where is no such interface? No. No such. I suppose I could look and see what the C code is doing too, but. probably be faster oops it's not what i wanted to do wg control internal wg open bsd let's go pull up that c code for the first time in a while so the c code already has a device when it gets to this point right no it's copying the device name and doing an iactal less than zero go to out okay so the iactal just it'll just return to out so no free okay that's to be expected i suppose we do want to test that case as well so uh yeah actually i think we're at the point where we can just go ahead and re-enable this test and it should work fine right i mean 
Uh oh, do I have a syntax error? I think I do. Whenever VS Code doesn't format on save, you know that you probably messed something up, right? Um, 134. Yes. Trailing colon or comma. Okay. Um, right, right, right. I need to pass the ioctal function. Oh, so this is where, hmm, this is the simulated version. We want to see what it gives us for real. So it gives us no such interface. Where is BSD error? No. Error numbers. No such interface. Is it just E no ent? I don't see any. I don't see an actual error number for no such interface. But, hmm. NXIO? ENXIO. Device not configured, E no TTY, inappropriate actal. Hmm. Now we're gonna have to, we'll have to see what it exactly it's returning. But I guess I could potentially compile the tools for C. Or actually I could try fetching a device that doesn't exist with this code, right? I mean, that would actually give us the, the proper error number. So that's exactly, that is the easy way. Um, let's see here. So log that print F error now percent plus V error. So now we need to go back to our main, go run main dot go, uh, WG one. Ah, really? Oh, that's why. File does not exist. Okay. Well, that's easy enough. So we can just go ahead and return that, I suppose. Um, I assume, so I assume that's gonna be something in syscall. Uh, did that not update? Failed to get device. Is my code unwrapping this somewhere? What am I looking at? Oh, am I, hang on a sec. C dot device. Let me see that device. Yep, so it's being, it's calling down into here. Good old uh, printf debugging, huh? I mean, it works. Works just fine. Are we, oh. I was gonna say, did we not recompile this? We're using go run. So, are the changes not? They are. Um, if it's invoking device directly, then I would think that this would work, right? I mean, what's the what's the deal here? There's some abstraction I forgot about. I guess that's possible. OpenBSD new client OpenBSD. Okay. Um, this should be the entry point. Uh, still nothing. It's like we're not even calling this code. Am I missing something silly here? So we create a WG control, initializes the clients, which for OpenBSD is going to use the kernel if it's configured. Uh, hang on a sec. Are we not? We're not in bash. <laughs> oh gosh, I should probably just get rid of this. I should probably just get rid of this silly, uh, silly thing. Go figure, it works just fine now. <laughs> wow. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Is it reasonable to, like, leave this in? Actually, you know, I could just change my shell, right? So change shell to bash. Uh, wait, I actually know, how to, I don't actually, 
I never use this. So chain shell dash s uh, bin bash root. Oh, which bash? Shell dash s user local bin bash root. Okay, so now if I log back in, we don't have bash. Uh, what did I do wrong? Um, shell portability is an issue. What's the lowest common denominator? Yeah, I think it's like K shell or something in here, but I just want bash. Like I just want something I'm familiar with, you know, for this development VM. Oh, um, yes. Oh God, VI. Uh, yeah, so it set my shell user bin bash, but it said the bash is at user local bin. Do I need to reboot maybe? Or log out? Uh, so I'm already running as root by the way. Um, I'm logged in as root on the uh, on the shell here. That's free BSD, not open BSD, ignore me. Okay. Yeah, I think, is this one of those like weird things where you just need to reboot the... Hmm. You know what? It's a computer. I'm going to give it a, I'm going to give it a reboot really quick. <laughs> it might be one of those things where like the, uh, the SSH, uh, Mux was messing with it. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, the thing is, is that like, I just don't want to spend like all day learning about some esoteric thing when I could reboot the VM for like, you know, take 10 seconds, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's just not a big enough deal where I want to keep devoting time, I guess. But thank you for the, thank you for the thoughts though. I appreciate it. As far as I can tell, the shell change applied, so I would expect that this would come back up. Okay, we're in bash. Perfect. All right, we're happy. No more, no more K-shell or whatever. Man, I need to trim my mustache. This is driving me nuts. The thing is right now is I have, like, no motivation to, like, mess with facial hair or anything, you know? But... Go run main.go. Uh, there are no devices, right? I think it's awesome you were sharing your personal space in this way and your thought process. Yeah, totally. I mean, the thing is, is that like everybody, you know, I'm happy to make embarrassing mistakes on stream or not know how to use shell commands or whatever. Like it's the reality is, is like we're all human and doing these kinds of things helps us to get better. Right. And I think it's really fun to, you know, share the projects I'm working on. So this is this whole streaming thing is new to me, but I'm really enjoying it so far. So it has been a blast for sure. Uh, we need to unwedge sshfs. So there we go. Your name, your name looks familiar. Did I see you were? Were you streaming as well? Because I think I saw like in one of my stream reports that surprisingly tolerates tangents. Yes. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think I saw in one of my stream reports that you were one of my top referrers or something. So cool. I'll have to check out your stream. Uh, let's see here. Can I follow you from this view? No, I cannot. Let me see here. Yeah, I think it'd be super cool to, uh, there we go. I think it'd be super cool to, you know, have like more of like a programming community on Twitch. You know, like I was able to re I was able to raid Filippo the other day, which was super fun. You know, today we might end up raiding a Mario streamer again or something. I guess we'll see, but, uh, yeah, cool. Awesome. Well, hope you're, hope you're having a good time streaming as well, you know? I certainly am, I know. So. What now? File does not exist. Okay, but we definitely have the environment variable set, right? We do not. So, is bash rc not... And yes, I've already made the layering violation joke. Yeah. Is bash rc not invoked by default? Does it need to be bash profile or something? I hate all this Linuxy stuff. Bash RC, or all these weird like Unix conventions. Okay, source Bash RC. Now I know for sure I've got it. So, anyway, device not configured. So zero x six. Let's see here. Golang OS.
So I wonder if these error numbers are the same on like Linux and such. So hex six is error no zero x six. ENXIO. Okay, so that's, that's what I would expect. So ENXIO means the device doesn't exist. So if that's what the kernel is saying, that's what we'll test for, and we are already doing that. And then ENO TTY, I wonder why I had that in there. Um, ENXIO. Um, so now we're just going to swap in this function again, and we'll have it return immediately an OS syscall error. Um, return OS new syscall error. Ioctl Unix dot e n x i o. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, remove that. Okay. Oops, I lost the stream for a sec there. Okay. Whether we are streaming or not, the real joy to me is engineering and tinkering out in the open. Open source software allows building things together. Regardless of who pays the salary, it is fun. Yes, I totally agree. In my mind, like, I think my open source work has been some of, if not the most fulfilling work I've ever done. You know, um, I'm just not as, I'm happy to write software for a paycheck and I'm happy to do the work that needs to be done. Um, but being able to do like passion projects like this is really where I think I excel, you know? And I, I think it's very cool that the open source software movement has allowed people to share everything that they're doing and building and like allow us to share knowledge and things like, you know, conferences, like open source has gotten me so far in my career, you know, in such a short time, like I, I can't imagine like not doing this, you know, um, I know there's the argument that like, you know, GitHub is not your resume and you know, you shouldn't necessarily spend all of your free time coding. You know, there's other things you could be doing. Um, but the thing is, is that, I enjoy doing this, and if I'm motivated to do it, I'm going to keep doing it. You know, um, I kind of wonder. I kind of wonder if people like you know. I do wonder if people in the industry who don't do any open source are at a disadvantage. But it's a yeah, it's a philosophical question, I guess. But it's definitely my resume. Yeah, for sure, Dominic. <laughs> Uh, make your employer pay you to write open source. Yeah, totally. That's, uh, that's definitely like kind of a dream, right? Um, the stuff I'm doing at Fastly right now at the moment is very specific to us. Uh, but yeah, I mean, who knows, right? That would be, that'd be cool. But... So now I'd expect that these tests all pass okay. Internal OpenBSD test. Device not configured. Oh, do I have to unpack that? I think I might have had some special case logic around that before. So, Golang. Or no. Um, let's go look at the code I just ripped out. <laughs> because I am guessing I probably ripped out some switch cases or something that were handling this for me. Yep, right here. Right here. Steal it back. Uh, now that we are on a newer version of Go, we could... Oh, I guess we're doing an unconditional. Okay. I don't see why this would be Eno TTY. I don't, I remember, I don't remember why I had that in there, to be honest. Because I feel like it's always going to be E-N-X-I-O, right? I guess for now, we should keep this as is. I think I had talked about integrating the newer uh, errors is APIs. That would have been nice, but. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> 12 gigabyte of RAM using bash script. Oh boy. Uh, shout out to Fastly for helping OpenBSD, BSD, excuse me, uh, deliver the files to everyone. CDN OpenBSD points to your employer currently. Yeah, that's great. You know, I'm, I'm super happy that we support causes like this, you know, and open source as a whole. Uh, WG control contract, it says, yeah, I think the, I think the contracts and stuff I wrote were pre all of the new APIs. So as long as I return something that's compatible with OS is not exist, it's fine. Um, so this is probably okay at the moment. Why did I have why did I have inappropriate IOCTL though? That's that's my question, I guess, right? Um 
because I, I guess I'm not sure how you would get that, but I guess I'll, I'll leave it alone for now. No such of a device to not exist. That's fine. That's okay. Sweet. Test pass, but that's because I disabled the other test, right? Yeah, okay. So this is what I'd expect. Oh, this is, I'm not even using the error anymore, am I? Right. I should be returning TT error. Yes, no wonder that that duplication did look strange to me, but I, I just wasn't thinking about it, you know. Um, okay. We're getting we're getting pretty close to pretty close to running out of stuff to do with this today, but it's okay, I suppose. All this code still exists, and now we have the code to the. I don't know. Test this before. Let's let's go take a look at GitHub again. Uh, shoot. Nope, nope. I should probably not aggressively close tabs, but the problem is, is I hate all the clutter. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Google Home, for the reminder. <laughs> probably something like make coffee, but... Oh, let's see. What was I doing before? I know there are ways to browse Git history in your CLI and stuff. I'm just lazy, right? I mean, it's just easier. It's just easy for me to do it this way. Oh, I did not mean to commit that interface file. I should get rid of that. Um, oops. Okay. Yeah, I think this function has to do a little more, a little more of a job now. Um, I can factor it out though. So we need the ability to fetch more information. Oh, does this does this work as is? I kind of don't like the test caching thing. I feel like it's, I, I don't know. Part of me thinks that like test caching is useful, but another part of me thinks it's just annoying because I have to do this count one thing all the time. Um, so how is this passing? If this isn't invoking, is it not invoking device? It is invoking device. It should be panicking, right? I mean, it's definitely, oh. That's right. We turned it off. Okay. It works really well for people with pure non-flaky tests. Yeah. Okay, there we go. That's what I would expect. Um, yes, yeah, so this is the whole thing again where I have to populate the structure. So we're just going to give basically the basic sanity checking. Yeah, okay. So we'll copy a lot of this logic. <laughs> this is so gross. Um, <laughs> oh boy. I'm, I'm going to want to refactor out some of the duplication here, I'm sure, but this is, it'll be okay for now. We're, we'll survive. WG data IO. Number of calls, number of WGIO calls. We're gonna rename a few of these things, I'm sure, but. Um, nothing, we're just gonna give it an empty, empty memory. So is this a no-op? Yeah, we just, we just do nothing here because we just care about the basic fields. So yeah, this is a no-op. And we don't care about this either. Actal, oh wow, auto complete's totally broken, as expected. Um, hmm. 
Ooh, starting to get hungry. Uh, we're coming up in about four hours. I think I'll probably wrap the stream once we once we finish this test um, or finish finish off these tests. I think it's probably a good time to call it. You know. What now? 118, huh? Um, did I forget to plug in the test again? Nope. Um, oh, too many calls to WG. Oh, I have to reset it per device, don't I? Right, right, right. So, this is kind of gross, right? But one really easy way to fix this is zero, two, one, three. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> that's that's the truth, right? Is uh, on the zeroth and first call, we'll do this, and then the second and third call, I'll do this. You know, I mean, that's that's fine. So, hey, look, the test pass. <laughs> uh, that's a little that's a little sketch. I'll have to document that pretty well. Um, let's see here. I'll rename this to IFGR calls. Right. Two calls per device where the first call indicates the number bytes to populate, and the second would normally populate the caller's memory. Uh, yeah. Test pass. Let's check the coverage. I just wanna, I just wanna see. So go test dash cover dash cover profile cover dot out dot. 52%. I feel like we should have more than that. I mean, right? I feel like we should definitely have more than that. Or is it not counting the... Let's look. Let's find out. Uh, oops. Uh, Do we lose SSHFS? That would be sad. Uh, no. Okay. I think it was just, okay. I think the shell was just like in an old directory before we, right, uh, go tool cover. Cool. Oh, pulls up in the right browser even, sweet. Okay. Did we, oh, we never checked this. Okay, we can write that test. Um, read only, we're not testing the real octals. Yes, that's true. Okay, that's okay. So we'll, we'll test the, we can test the case where we pass the wrong number of bytes back, right? And make sure we don't get into uninitialized memory. That'd be a good idea. Good uh, sanity check, I suppose. So we're going to take the device test. Or we're going to take probably this test, actually. Um, not exist. I feel like we can just remove all this scaffold if we're only going to check the one case, right? I mean, there's no point in having subtests for one test. I don't know why I had Eno TTY, probably some artifact of the old API, but I suspect this is okay as is for now, right? I mean, there's no real reason to keep that code around if it's never going to be needed. What is the problem? 191. Uh, oh, comma. There we go. Yep. Much tidier. Uh, test client device, oops, test client device not exist, test client device, so after not exist, we also have memory, yeah, the memory allocation, test client device, uh, wrong memory size, something like that, seems okay, data, data.size equals one, Nonsensical number of bytes back to the caller. WGO, and we would expect an error along the lines of, we don't have that error factored out, do we? Unexpected kernel return, unexpected number of bytes. 
this is where we could like unwrap the errors and stuff, but I think it's probably just sufficient here to check if there is an error at all, right? I mean, so if we do, well, really quick, uh, error equals nil, t fatal, expected, and error, but none occurred. That would be bad. That'd be very bad. Um. Sometimes in these cases, I'll just like to log the error so I can like check it in the, the test logs later. Um, that, that works pretty well. Missing return 204. Ah. Yep. True. Okay. Uh, go test dash V. Kernel return unexpected number of bytes. Perfect. So yeah, I think we did a pretty good job today getting this back going again. Um, it's unfortunate we ran into that bug where we couldn't really move on, but I think this was valuable at least, you know? So let's uh, let's tidy this up and get this committed. See if there's anything else that needs to be changed, but otherwise I think we are done with our VM. So we're adding a new field. We are re-implementing the device logic in terms of the new IOCTL interface. Add the cast, zero, populating the very basics. Good job on reporting that bug kernel debugging on stream. Yeah, totally. I, I'm glad to, uh, glad to help out, you know. This is how software gets better. So I think it's I think it's worth doing stuff like that too, for sure. There's probably a bit of room to factor this sort of thing out with this uh these IOCTL population test fixtures, but it's okay. Uh, we want to remove the header file, but we want to keep all of these generated definitions. We don't want the header, though, so because I accidentally committed that earlier. And we don't need it because it's in the kernel sources, so git add star. Dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, git status. Git add star, git status. Cool, okay. Internal open BSD. Um, basic device fetching, right? So basic device fetching with new API. Okay. Let's go verify that the CI builds and stuff still pass. I don't think I, I don't think I have an open BSD builder, unfortunately. I've got free BSD, which is pretty cool. Um, failure, what failed? I'm guessing I forgot to run static check or something again. No surprise there. Oh, I do have an open BSD builder. Nice, go me. I don't think I have the kernel module though. Module requires go 113. Oh. So the wire guard stuff started pulling in go 113. So we're also, where do we pull in wire guard device though? Oh, I think it's the Linux stuff. Shoot. I'm sure your code is free of bugs. Yeah. I was hoping we wouldn't have to. Uh... See, I was trying to avoid dropping support for 112 because I know people always end up running really old versions of stuff, but I think our hand might be forced a little bit if the wire guard code is work using newer versions of Go, and we have to depend on some of that because we need the Windows pipe functions. Um, shoot. Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess we can drop support for 112. Like, I'm okay with it. Like, I just know there's going to be somebody who will be upset about it, you know. But we do the best we can. So if I try and set this to, what was it? So if I set the go module to 112, it's not going to work anymore, right? Um, is that the idea here? So, oh, I don't want to do this on my VM anymore. Actually, I want to close that session out. Uh, get reset, oh, GRHH, there we go. So my local checkout of this repository, pull that back up. Open VS code here. We can get rid of the SSHFS. Get rid of that. All gone. So now, if I change this to go 112, then I would expect that it won't compile anymore because the WireGuard module requires 113, right? Um, hmm. Oh, actually, you know, I have those. Uh, I do have 112. Yeah, 112, 12. Because I, I was testing stuff a long time ago. Build, okay. 
Go S equals Windows go build. Maybe it was go 111? No. Linux 112. Oh gosh. I'm hard coded to 113 here. 113.3. Wow. That's embarrassing, right? <laughs> Oops. We will we'll fix that up another day. I don't really want to get into the CI system right now, you know? I just want to see if this uh failed. Two of them failed, okay. OpenBSD and Linux. Yep. Um I might tidy this up off stream or something. Yeah, device UAPI errors as. Yep. No more 112. And the BSD stuff also pulling 112, maybe? OpenBSD 6.5. That's probably why. I probably want to do 6.6 6 now or something. Okay, anyway. Um, I think we're probably going to call that a stream. So, hey, thank you all for hanging out. This has been a ton of fun. Um, let's see here. Let's go see if there's anybody that we can raid. You know, just do some more goofy stuff. Oh, hey, it looks like, uh, so Christine is streaming something. It says NA. Let's, let's see. Hang on a sec. Let's see. Twitch.tv. Goes by Princess Zen on experiments in generative music. Sweet. Uh, yeah, let's go send Christine a raid. That'd be, that could be pretty fun. So, all right. Thank you all for hanging out. I really appreciate it. And in a few seconds here, we will start the raid. So, hey, take care.